And now, broadcasting live from the restaurant at the end of the universe, this is the history of the Atlantic world. Hello and welcome to part three of our opening series, Rise of the Conquistadors. My name is Jesse Wiest and thank you for joining us. We left off last episode in the aftermath of the conquest of the Monsieur Jean de Bethencourt. Castilian influence had burst out onto the Atlantic as well in the early 15th century, and Castilian financed expeditions to the Canaries and to North Africa had become increasingly frequent. Now, as we continue, we are going to talk an awful lot in this podcast about broad historical ideas which have impact across generations, Uh, ideas like feudalism, capitalism, a lot of isms, in fact, the Industrial Revolution is another. Um, In fact, one of the main themes I would like you to take away from this series, The Rise of the Conquistadors, is that Bethencourt failed to create a, a Norman colony in the Canaries because of the unavoidable Castilian dominance, which existed um, as a result of the quote-unquote footloose manpower possessed by Castile in comparison to other would-be European overseas predator states. Um, Fernandez Ernesto is the historian from whom that uh, footloose manpower phrase comes from, uh, which I think is just a fantastic phrase. Um, Today, though, we're going to shift our focus a little west of Castile uh, to Portugal, because there, in that small underpopulated nation, which had been created in the fires of reconquest and crusade, was born a prince who would go on to have such an enormous impact on the world that by the end of his life, Portugal will have the privileged position in the Atlantic, and it will be Castile who will be playing catch-up as Portuguese ships, the best in the world, enable the creation of a Portuguese overseas empire, with colonies on Madeira and the Azores in the Atlantic, and which stretched farther and farther down the African coast in search of slaves and gold. Now, before the end of the 15th century, the Portuguese will have completed journeys around the Horn of Africa, where they will meet the, the Ethiopia, the site uh, uh, of the famed uh, Prester John legend in Europe, and That will connect them into the vast trade networks that connected East Africa and India and uh, Southeast Asia. And that means that by the time of Christopher Columbus, who first goes to Portugal in search of patronage for a trip west to China, the Portuguese replied, West? No. No. You're a dumbass. You go south and around Africa if you want to go try and to go to China. Now, afterwards, Columbus went to Castile, who footed the bill for the Genoan navigator to so he could attempt a westward journey to Asia and kind of let them try and catch up with the Portuguese. And so if not for the accidental discovery by Columbus of the Americas, the history of the world would have been very different. Obviously, that's true, but the 16th century, I think in particular, would have been dominated by Portugal, not Spain. Now, broad historical ideas have enormous impact on our lives, on history, and much can be understood by, uh, or much can be explained by understanding them, I should say. But individual people matter too. And really, what is a broad historical concept anyway, other than a collection of individual people? And so our tale continues today in Portugal, where we will encounter, if I may, 
in the parlance of our times, encounter the first great dude of history here on our journey through the Atlantic world. In fact, here we meet a dude so great that most traditional histories covering these sorts of topics kind of just start at this point, stating that with Enrique's life, uh, a, a, a so-called age of discoveries was ushered in, uh, and, and from that, uh, Columbus and everybody else followed. And there's uh, some truth to that, and a lot uh, not exactly true, but at any rate. Um, this guy was perhaps the greatest knight of his day. And his life, more than anyone else who we could possibly talk about, best encapsulates the principles of chivalry and the European spirit of conquest. He's a, a great dude so great that he is known to history by his nickname, the Navigator. Now, born to royal blood, the Infant Dom Henrique was born on March 4th in the year 1394, as the third son of the Portuguese king John I and Queen Philippa, who herself was from England and related to the English royal family as well. Legend states that Henrique was born from his mother's womb, already holding a cross in his hand. Now, this legend seems to have sprang directly from the Dom himself, according to Peter Russell, who is the author of Prince Henry, The Navigator a Life, an excellent autobiography. Um, see, yeah, autobiography, biography. And and he calls it an act which shows Henrique's deep love of chivalry and the conquistadoring life. Now, he truly believed he was born into the world the crusade against Islam. Now, other than that, we don't really know a whole lot about Henrique's youth, but it's safe to say he probably made good use of his uh, station in life, I'd say. As the son of a king, I think he probably obtained an excellent education that would befit any knight or prince. And he probably paid attention in class or what have you. As an adult, because I say that as an adult, he showed very some special skill in politics, warfare, and business. Um, now, he burst onto the stage of history at the age of 21 during the Portuguese siege of Queta, a city on the African coast of the Mediterranean Sea that was important for its deep connections to trade routes into sub-Saharan Africa. Zurara stated that it was, quote, the most glorious conquest of which famous victory the heavens felt the glory and the earth the benefit, unquote. Though in truth, as we shall see, despite the initial successes uh, of the Portuguese in taking the city, in the long run, uh, the Portuguese uh, state as a whole and nation as a whole ends up gaining very little. And I should say, I, I guess quote-unquote nation. Uh, nation is, would not be a good definition of what the European states were at this time. Now, at any rate, by necessity, getting to know Henrique means we will also be getting quite familiar with the author of uh, the early Portuguese history during this time. Uh, a knight in the Order of Christ, his name was Gomez Cans de Zorara. Now, the knightly order uh, of Christ it, it is the knightly order of Portugal of which Henrique will later become headmaster. So we want to throw that out there. Uh, Zurara sets out, a, in fact, a chapter aside in the Chronicle of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea uh, to tell us about uh, the virtues and habits of the great and glorious prince. And he asks us, the reader, important questions about his lord. And I'm going to read some of these questions here because I think they're very important. Um, questions like, quote, <clears throat> Where else, besides Henrique, could, couldst thou find one so religious, so Catholic, one so prudent, one of so good counsel, one of so temperate of all his actions? Where couldst thou light on such magnanimity, such frankness, such humanity, such courage, and a sport so great in so many toils as his? Where could you find <clears throat> another human body that would endure the toil he underwent in arms. A toil that was but scarcely diminished in the time of peace. And what courage, what endurance, could be greater than that of the man who is victor over himself? Yet he endured hunger and thirst as well, a matter almost past belief. Azarara concludes, O oh, fortunate prince, honor of our kingdom, what single thing was there in thy life 
which they who praise thee ought to pass by in silence. What moment of thy time was barren of thy goods or empty of praise? Unquote. So, clearly the history we have of Henrique and the early Portuguese history which Zurara represents is just going to be a little bit tilted toward Henrique's favor. And especially, we could say, obviously at the expense of the Portuguese kings, Henrique's father and later his brothers, who almost certainly had at least a little more to do with some of the decision-making that has been fully attributed to Henrique. But, so we should keep that in mind. Henrique is purposefully presented as the chief hero of this tale. But with that said, Zurara's voice is still invaluable to us today. Um... Not a lot of the conquistadors were writing down uh, their thoughts, at least that we have, that have survived. Uh, Actually, come to think of it, probably a few of them did and just didn't come down to us. But he offers us excellent accounts of the Portuguese expeditions to Africa, which open up the Atlantic world. And in addition, while I don't agree with Zerara, Henrique is no hero of mine, The Dom's contributions to the history of the Atlantic world are so great that it is impossible to discuss any further history of the Atlantic world without talking about him first. So, here we are. Now, the Portuguese fleet that attacked Queta left the port of Targus and headed south. Now, this was the largest fleet likely ever assembled by the Portuguese, and upon the decks of those ships was probably the largest army fielded up by the country up to that point. Now, they set sail on Friday the 26th of July in the year 1415. Now, unfortunately for the people of Queta, the rest of the Muslim world for that matter as well, no one except for a few of the Portuguese commanders and Henrique's father knew where the fleet was going. Now, of course, this also served to petrify the rest of Christian Europe as well, uh, because despite the success of the secrecy involved, wherein only King John, a few of his generals, and his sons were the only ones aware of the target, the size of the fleet, and the fact that it would be engaging in conquest was not kept secret. In fact, they apparently left port with much fanfare. The size of the fleet was gigantic, um, especially for the age. Um... About a hundred chartered or requisitioned merchant ships made up the bulk of the fleet, and most of these were foreign vessels, Castilian, Flemish, Germans, Bretons, Englishmen. In addition to carrying the army, these also carried large amounts of lumber and siege engines, including significant numbers of cannon, the newest and greatest weapon of the day at the start of the 15th century in Europe, um, and a squadron of 20 royal galleys accompanied the troop and supply-carrying merchant ships. Now, the army on board the fleet totaled, in total, 19,000 men, uh, 5,400 men-at-arms, 1,900 mounted bowmen, uh, 3,000 unmounted bowmen, and 9,000 footmen. And like the fleet, the army, uh, too, was not all Portuguese. Uh, It included some numbers of Frenchmen, Flemings, and Englishmen, uh, one of which included uh, a a man named Antoine de de La Salle, and I don't know exactly how he is related to Gadifer de La Salle, who we met last episode, and I'm not really interested in genealogy enough to research the fact, but I did think it was interesting enough to include in this episode. The army assembled was so large that it soon became clear to the Portuguese leadership that there were not enough stores of food to feed the army, a fact which could have clued in some that the fleet could not have had a destination that was too distant from Portugal, though this fact seems to have escaped most, if not all, of the Portuguese of, of the Mediterranean world. Um, now, as a result of this, the Portuguese crown had to re- requisition and charter more ships, uh, including considerable number of numbers of caravels and other types of fishing vessels, so they could transport troops uh, faster. And I want to take a brief aside here to get into the heads of the neighbors of the Portuguese here, because if we remember the example of Bethencourt on the Canaries and on Africa, that even if a conquest of a particular place was planned, If bad weather meant that the fleet got derailed and landed somewhere else, well, there's no need to not conquest whatever place that could be. 
Um, so I think it's very possible that even if Portugal's neighbors had concluded that they definitely knew exactly where the Portuguese fleet was intending to go, that still leaves a puncher's chance that Mother Nature intervenes and 19,000 conquistadors bearing cannons and other weaponry are standing outside your front door on the island of Sicily instead of Queda, for example. Um, rumors floated throughout Europe and the Mediterranean about where the Portuguese were headed, partly as a result of red herrings spread by the Portuguese crown itself. Um, the reasons for this are apparent enough. The success of the conquest depended on the Moroccan stronghold of Queta being unprepared. Um, apparently, even the vast majority of the expedition itself believed they were headed to the island of Sicily. Um, while the intended destination of the Portuguese conquistadors was murky to most of the medieval world, the reasons for the attack were abundantly clear since Queta was an important node on the Saharan trade routes which stretched deep into sub-Saharan Africa, and those enabled Europe and the rest of the Mediterranean to access luxury goods from sub-Saharan Africa, especially gold and slaves. Now, I think it is fair that I point out that Peter Russell, Henry's biography, disagrees with me here, which is actually a great place to showcase my problem with biographies in general. They lead to hero worship, if you ask me. And that creates kind of an incomplete vision of the past. Russell argues that Henrique was motivated by religious and crusading zealotry instead of economic and strategic reasons for the attack. Now, with all due respect to Peter Russell, in this regard, he is way out of his element. I just shut the fuck up. With that said, Peter the... <laughs> Prince Henry the Navigator of Life is a great biography. Um, seriously, it won some distinguished awards, and you should check it out sometime. But in crafting a hero out of Henrique, Russell fails to observe the simple fact that the chivalrous knight to the chivalrous knight of the 15th century, there is no problem, um, as there would say, like a modern-day uh, uh, interpretation of Christianity um, that there's, there was no problem for them with conquest. Uh, to Henrique and his peers, both Christians and Muslim knights, I should add, during this era, a successful conquest was proof of their devotion to God and of their divine providence in their actions. And, and I mean, literally, an unsuccessful conquest meant that you were, like, it's, if, if you, if the Attack on Queda had failed. It is entirely likely that, uh, you know, a lot of the conquistadors would have gone back home and 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 blamed it on, you know, uh, everyone not being pious enough. Um, and I and I just want to say that I think the opposite is true too. There are other historians who would probably argue that Henry was not related. Uh, was not motivated by religion, but instead by economics. And and what I want to point out is the distinguish, uh, distinction is is to the medieval mind, and especially to I'd say the kind of crusading type individuals who existed in the Christian and Muslim world, who knights who wanted to go to war. There is no distinction at all between what they believed in with their religion and what they thought would happen to them with their uh, their positive economic gain, I should say. Okay, I hope that kind of makes sense. Queda itself was a major commercial port <clears throat> and one of the strongest fortresses in the Mediterranean world. Now, the city sat upon the tip of northwest Africa and faced both the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, so it's kind of directly south of Portugal there. And it defended itself with a moat, walls, and towers, and, and that served as a pretty intimidating defense. The city was a great thorn inside of the conquistadors, especially the Castilians, uh, since from Queda, the still independent Taifa state of Granada could be resupplied with food, troops, and other supplies whenever the Castilians, or anyone else for that matter, tried to conquer that kingdom. Um, through trade with Europe, with Christian and Jewish minority populations, basically, Queda received horses, silver, and other goods, which merchants carried south through the deeply held secret routes into the Sahara, 
and exchanged these items for gold, slaves, ivory, and spices. Quetta also exported huge amounts of wheat that was grown in the Atlantic region of the Muslim world to the rest of the Mediterranean. But as mighty as Quetta was, economically, it was in decline. In comparison to previous centuries, when Marinid emperors used Quetta to host powerful fleets of galleys, at the start of the 15th century, the naval power of Quetta was solely in the hands of the various merchants, Muslim and Christian corsairs, and other pirates who resided in the city and was used uh, as a base for, for, for operations for all of these folks. Most of these people, as soon as they received wind of the incoming Portuguese fleet, departed along with their ships as quickly as possible for safer harbor. As a result, naval defense played no part in the coming action whatsoever. Now, Europe's limited knowledge of Africa's interior at this time came from places like Quetta where small immigrant communities of Jewish and Italian traders lived in small communities called fundunks. Uh, much like minority populations in the Christian world of Jewish and Muslim uh, traders, these minority populations of traders in the Muslim world were not only tolerated, but sometimes encouraged uh, by authorities, since minorities of different religions were much more easily taxable subjects. It's a win-win for both parties, kind of. In, of course, this isn't necessarily very popular with the rest of the population um, in Spain, and then later in Portugal, this will lead to the Inquisition. Here in Quetta, the sometimes fractious relationship between the Muslim majority population of Quetta and the minority merchants, most of whom were Jewish, but many were also were Christian, led to occasional acts of violence against these minority groups and medieval lynchings. Uh, if you will, this is the official justification that the Portuguese crown uses for the attack of Quetta. Now, the Portuguese nobility provides further reasonings behind the planned invasion. The royal princes themselves complained that since Portugal was too small and too poor a country to supply them with ample estates, uh, it made the Morocco campaign necessary. Now, this isn't to argue that all of Portugal was for the war. Uh, far from it, the financial burden alone uh, of the conquest was enormous. Modern historians have concluded that, in fact, King John could not afford the invasion. And as a result, this could have had, I mean, calamitous results for the country. Now, in addition to the strain of the financial cost, many in Portugal questioned the rationality of attacking Queda, since that would probably just benefit Castile by weakening Granada. In a similar vein, there were fears that by removing so many of the fighting men from within Portugal's borders, that the venture risked an attack by Castile. Of course, the neighboring Iberians were not the only concern of the Portuguese naysayers. The crown also was warned of retaliatory attacks on Portuguese by all of Muslim Africa, not just the residents of Quetta. Now, these warnings against the crusade seem to be authenticated by God himself in many, to, in, too many in Portugal when an outbreak of smallpox broke out in Lisbon shortly before the launch of the expedition, which infected and killed many, including some of the soldiers in the conquest, and Queen Philippa, Henrique's mother. Shortly afterwards, a long eclipse of the sun occurred. Another ill omen, according to the tradition, and by this time, some of the king's advisers began to oppose the enterprise. Henrique and his brothers, though, fought against public opinion and uh, they con to, uh, to, to continue the operation, and soon they launched, and the Portuguese made their way to the Straits of Gibraltar by August 10th, and two days later attempted to land. Foul winds, however, carried some of the king's galleys all the way to the main port of Quetta, which forced the rest of the expedition to wait for the return, which took two days, and that fact alone seems to have completely ruined the advantage of surprise. Um, but uh, the Portuguese were aided when the ruler of Quetta, a man named Sala Ben Sala, saw the Portuguese galleys, which had accidentally made their way into the port of Quetta, he made the decision that the Portuguese threat was over when they left, and so he sent reinforcements home, who, which were necessary to properly man the defenses of the city. Uh, twin pest outbreaks of pestilence and famine had recently plagued Quetta, and thus, without the reinforcements, 
a proper defense of the city was not possible. To make matters worse, when the Portuguese did start to land on the beach, Sala ben Sala ordered some of his depleted garrison out from the safety of the city walls to attack the Portuguese as they landed. The Portuguese, though, were far too many, and when the Moroccan defenders could not prevent the landing, the odds markedly changed in favor of the Portuguese. Thus, after encircling the city by land and sea, with many engines of war and much artillery, an intense bombardment of the city's defenses by the cannons on the ships followed next, which is a fact that Henrique's chronicler Zerara omits, says Peter Russell, uh, the uh, author of the biography, likely to increase the... And, and Zerara probably did that to probably increase the heroism of Henrique's personal actions that occurred during the assault that followed. Now, the conquest of Queda by the Portuguese was actually carried out in a single day, on the 21st of August, 1415, after an assault that lasted just 13 hours. A most remarkable feat of medieval warfare, says Russell. The king's eldest son and Henrique's older brother, the Dom Duarte, personally led the troops off the beachhead at the foot of the mountain Mont Albe. Here, Henrique showed all of the qualities that would bring him fame and fortune throughout his life. Brash, selfish bravery, uh, and that which earned him a reputation for being an impetuous and an imprudent soldier. As we will see, these qualities will both help and hinder Henrique during his lifetime. As for the prince who would one day be known as the navigator, according to Zerara, he was a captain of the very great and powerful fleet, and like a brave knight, fought and toiled in person on the day when it was to be taken from the Moors. Zurara continues that, On that day, the blows he dealt out were conspicuous beyond those of all other men, since for in the space of five hours he never stopped fighting, and neither the heat, though it was very great, nor the amount of his toil were able to make him retire and take any rest. And in this space of time, the prince, with four who accompanied him, made a valiant stand. For, as to the others who should have followed in his company, some were scattered through that vast city, and others were not able to join him by reason of a gate through which the infant and the said four companions had passed together um, with the moors, which gate was guarded by moors on the top of the wall. So, for about two hours... The prince and his friends held another gate, which is beyond the one which stands, in a turn of the wall under a shadow of the castle. So, what, what he's saying there, Henrique ran so far ahead of the rest of the advancing Portuguese force that he found himself trapped under a portcullis, and he would have been killed if he had not, and frankly, he would have been killed. Uh, he was actually rescued by his childhood tutor. Uh, and a, a devoted family friend, the governor of his household, who uh, was slain uh, himself in saving the infant. Uh, now, despite this, and as a result of the overall success of the battle, I should say, uh, Henrique was knighted together with his brothers by his father's hand with great honor. This happened on Thursday, the 21st day of August, 1415, and afterwards the king, after having knighted his sons, and after killing many of the Moors and delivering the city, he repaired it and returned it very honorably to Portugal. The repair of the city was not just necessary because of the, bombard of the bombardment. In the immediate aftermath of the assault, the Portuguese force, in accordance with normal practice, I should say, began to loot the city. While they did not know exactly where the gold originated from, the Portuguese Fidalgos and their squires were well aware of Queda's position as a center of the gold trade with sub-Saharan Africa, and enthused by tales of the wealth of the city's merchants, they plundered the place mercilessly, says Peter Russell. Unfortunately for the conquistadors, their ignorance prevented them from obtaining much greater wealth than they did. Apparently they spent much of their time digging up graves and and the floors of buildings, uh, looking for buried treasure, um, which in their, I guess, uh, their defense, the Christians were pretty fond of doing that in their own uh, monasteries, for example. Um, and they wasted and burned much of the real treasure in the city in the form of spices, conserves, oils, and other commodities. Um, the victorious Fidalgos did not confine their hostilities to the Muslim inhabitants of Queda. Um, 
This following bit is from uh, Russell Peters' Henry the Navigator Life. Quote, The Genoese merchants resided there, once they realized a Portuguese victory was inevitable, had sought belatedly to ingratiate themselves by offering help to the conquistadors. This proved them to little avail. The Portuguese, intoxicated by the spirit of crusade, were not disposed to show any consideration to co-religionaries whom they regarded as guilty of the crime of trading with the infidel. Unquote. King Fernando of Aragon wrote to Henrique's father to complain about the treatment of a Sicilian merchant who had re received uh, by the Portuguese kings uh, who oh excuse me by the treatment uh, uh, that a Por Sicilian merchant had received by the Portuguese king's own nephew during the siege of Queda. Fernando found it understandable that the merchant's stores of wheat had been seized by the looting conquistadors, but the king's nephew had also tortured him until the merchant had finally signed a document surrendering to his tormentor a quantity of gold coin and other property which he owned in Valencia. The Portuguese did not come to Queta only for the sake of religion. Quoting Russell again, like all medieval crusaders before them, they considered that it was a natural right to reward themselves by seizing whatever booty they could and were not particular about whom they seized it from, unquote. Now, the victory, uh, to be perfectly honest, astonished Christian Europe. Uh, when news of the Portuguese success made its way back north, and, and this is a pivotal event in Portuguese history, for Henrique especially, because it gives him experience in colonial administration. Um, because in the aftermath of the conquest of, of Queda, the Portuguese ruled the city via a colonial governor, who was appointed by King John, but who would report to Henrique, while the king and his advisors continued to plan further military expeditions, and they themselves were actually debating whether or not to penetrate further into Morocco, or instead return north to invade Granada. Um, <clears throat> But for, for Henrique's father, however, his ambitions would actually end shortly after the sack of Queda. Um, not everyone at home in Portugal was thrilled with what was going on. Many apparently believed that the attack on Queda would satisfy the spirit of conquest, which existed within the royal bloodline. Those who hoped for that argued that the cost of the political administration and military garrison, which was about 2,500 soldiers, was too expensive. And some of the most prominent nobility in Portugal were not entirely convinced that a 21-year-old Henrique was the best choice to be in charge of the whole operation either. Further, the ability for Portuguese merchants and noblemen to profit off Queda dramatically decreased in the immediate aftermath of the conquest, when the majority of the population of the city simply left while Sala Ben Sala, the previous ruler before the Portuguese, was making his concessions. So many left that before long, the only Moorish inhabitants in Portuguese Queda were those who had been enslaved during the conquest, or Muslim knights and noblemen who were being held in order that they could be ransomed off. More important for John personally, though, than either opposition back home or the loss of a productive working population in Queda, was that he was sick and getting sicker. The next year, in 1416, he would be dead from disease. By 1415, he had returned to Portugal, leaving behind a garrison of around 3,000 men, and had left his, his son Henrique this, to give the keys to the city to the new colonial governor, and to lead the defense against the inevitable Moroccan counterattack. Now, this incident in Henrique's early adulthood cemented his lifelong dedication to maritime crusade in Africa. And it also gave him experience governing overseas colonies necessary for the success of that sort of thing. Quoting, as, uh, quoting Zarara, um, quote, After taking the city of Queda, he always kept ships well armed against the infidel, both of war and because he also had a wish to sh know the land that lay beyond the Isles of Canary. So Henrique fitted out a very great armada to show the natives there the way of the holy faith, unquote. Now, to do so, Henrique focused his efforts on sponsoring missions that might arrive at and eventually pass beyond the, that, quote, that cape called Bojador. For up to that time, neither by writing nor by the memory of man 
was known with any certainty the nature of the land beyond the Cape. Some said indeed that St. Brandon had passed that way. There was another tale of two galleys rounding the Cape which never returned, unquote. Zurara speaks here of the Vivaldi brothers, uh, the Genoan brothers who precede Henry's interest in the African Atlantic actually by about a hundred years, and whose disappearance probably contributed to the European fear of Cape Bojador. Now, Henry never accomplished his goals in Africa, which included conquering all of Morocco, finding far more gold than the Portuguese ever got, and finding Prester John. Um, Africans were more than powerful enough to maintain control within their territory against the arriving would-be conquistadors um, in, uh, in the sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but Henrique did open up trade on the Atlantic between the two continents. And after his death, Portugal and Ethiopia did become connected, which, as we said, which is where Prester John was supposedly uh, uh, from, or from the legend sprang. Now, Henrique's expeditions to the Canaries were a lot less successful, um, and they resulted in little more than wasted Portuguese blood and treasure. Uh, on the other hand, Henrique did la achieve lasting success when his navigators rediscovered the uninhabited islands of Madeira and the Azores. Zurara notes that Henrique caused these islands to be peopled, and from which the Portuguese drew large supplies of wheat, sugar, wax, honey, and wood, and many other good things, which profited both the Portuguese and also foreigners who gained great profit, says Zurara. Now, at the, as a result of all of this, Henrique, more than any other person, catapulted Portugal, and as a result, the rest of Europe, into the Atlantic. His vision of a Portuguese overseas empire, based on providing a legal framework and protection uh, to a fusion of mercantile naval power and land-hungry conquistadors, was so successful that long after his death, Portugal's adherence to this vision of empire resulted in Portuguese domination of new global trade networks that developed alongside further European conquest in the Americas, molded in many ways on the example of the Portuguese. If nothing else, we can view the next 200 years of Portuguese history after this incident in 1415 as one long extended attempt to conquer or at least circumnavigate Moroccan economic control of the Saharan trade. Now, these are all topics that we're going to cover from here on out in this episode, but for now, let's go back to Queda and the Portuguese colonial administration that followed after the conquest. Now, King John uh, notified the officials of the Kingdom of Portugal in, in February of 1416 that he had placed Henrique in charge of Queda, quote, in all matters pertaining to our city of Queda and the defense thereof, unquote. It soon became clear to everyone involved in the Portuguese colonial administration that since Queda was so far away from Portugal and across an ocean, it would be very reliant on the Portuguese metropolis for supplies while simultaneously the isolation from the rest of the kingdom forced the Portuguese crown to give more freedom to the colonial governor there in comparison to frontier castles uh, within the Iberian Peninsula. Now, the problem of shipping was especially difficult. In addition to the consequences of whatever foul winds or storms might crop up on any Portuguese ships headed to or from Queda, the Straits of Gibraltar were full of corsairs, who regularly preyed upon the square-rigged merchant ships, which were used to keep Queda regularly, regularly provisioned at the time. And if there are certain themes in history that I ascribe to and wish to impart on you, uh, their impact... Um, uh, well, this is a case of such a time. Uh, here we have a case of necessity breeding innovation. Henrique and the Portuguese conquistadors needed to supply Queda, and let us quote from Russell, quote, It was early recognized that much reliance would have to be placed on the caravel, a new type of sailing vessel originally designed for ocean-going fishing, but laterally designed, de excuse me, developed by the Portuguese for carrying a cargo. These small, latine-rigged craft had the speed of 
maneuverability, and shallow drought calculated to make them much more able than square-rigged vessels to beat against contrary winds or to evade attacks by hostile vessels. Unquote. The caravel would go on to revolutionize seaborne commerce because of their maneuverability against both enemy vessels and foul winds, and because that for the Portuguese, even and for Henrique, even the chief disadvantage of their use um, would eventually become an eventual boon, uh, because the caravel had a small carrying capacity than the smaller rigged sailing vessels, and so more were required to keep Quetta provisioned. And in the coming decades, this abundance of caravels kind of propels Portugal from being a tiny nation on the periphery of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean world to a kingdom capable of projecting power across the globe. Now, another problem, though, besides shipping, was funding. The idea at the time was that the crown itself must assume, assume total responsibility for organizing, funding, and arranging for the flow of supplies to Quetta. Large sums of money from a variety of sources were set aside annually for this purpose, and when this was not enough, a special annual poll tax of ten reyes was instituted throughout Portugal. As you might imagine, the, quote, ten reyes for Queda, unquote, tax was super popular, and nobody ever complained about it at all. Henrique profited handsomely by running the Casa de Queda, a warehouse in Lisdom from which Queda was supplied. Now, Henrique's aging father, John, didn't really put much oversight into the business, which Peter Russell says would be better described as the Queda Agency, I guess, in English. And so we don't really know how much he profited from the business and exactly what sort of activities were going on. Um, only that when Henrique's brother Duarte took the front throne in 1433, he put much more effort at record keeping than their father had done, uh, or than his father had done, excuse me. And and so that may have had, so he may have had some suspicion uh, about the amount of wealth being funneled through his brother's hands unseen. Um, nevertheless, the Casa de Queta became. Uh, one of the most powerful agencies in the kingdom, quickly, and it had its own treasurer by 1426, uh, and that position was promoted to chief treasurer by 1438. The Casa de Queta also had its own in-house coopers and potters, exporting these products throughout the empire. Numerous craftsmen, including carpenters, sailmakers, caulkers, and other specialist shipwrights, were permanently employed by and attached to the casa to serve the caravels and merchant ships under charter to it. Now, Henrique's experience running the casa gave him plenty of experience in the world of mercantilism. Uh, and this naval warehouse uh, that he runs makes him, you know, something of a proto-capitalist. And that's pretty unusual amongst European royalty for certain in the 1400s. And this experience makes Henrique the logical choice to oversee his Portuguese expeditions in Africa when they begin a little later in the 1400s. Now, a lot of people in Portugal, as I said, really don't like this, um, especially the idea of having to pay a tax to support all of this. When this happens... Uh, Henrique does what any good knight would do uh, in who is in this situation. He tells everyone that everything he's doing, including the tax, are all in service to Henrique's devotion to Christ and crusading against the infidels. Now, so with that said, these two problems, funding and shipping, that the Portuguese are having after the capture of Queda led to some serious problems with provisioning. By 1418, King John even petitioned the Pope for permission to trade with the Muslims, especially for food, explaining that this abrupt about-face, that it was his intention to convert the Moroccan infidels, either by love or by fear. But it wasn't just food that the Portuguese were having trouble getting to Queda. Besides the knights and squires who were eager to fight for honor and booty, normally in the form of human beings captured in skirmish battles, very few Portuguese men seemed to have much interest in going to Queda. Captured Muslim knights could be especially lucrative captures, um, and Portuguese corsairs uh, operated freely out of Queda, and the royal governor, who answered to Henrique, mowed most of his money from ransoming captives captured at sea. Uh, 
Um, now, but for the Portuguese men who were not sailors, willing to engage in piracy, or knights and would-be knights looking for booty, Queda offered almost nothing. Soldiers stationed there deserted frequently, sneaking away on boats in the middle of the night for Castilian territory. The crown, in response, forced soldiers to stay on past their terms in order to keep the garrison manned something more than a few U.S. military know about nowadays, and, well, this made the destination even less popular in the Portuguese military. Now, the Portuguese soldiers at Coita even had to suffer the indignity of having to listen to the jeers of passing Castilian vessels, whose sailors would make fun of the Portuguese for their crampy post at Coita while they were on their way to glory. Attempts to attract settlers amongst the civilian population failed repeatedly, and so the crown populated Queda by offering leniency to felons sentenced to the death penalty from crimes of murder, rape, treason, coining, buggery, or the practice of magic. Criminals convicted of these crimes were granted to exile at Queda instead of this, uh, instead of facing the death penalty, and in fact, this actually became a class of people, uh, of degraded ones, or degradados in, in Portuguese. And that became a noticeable proportion of the Portuguese population in the city. Um, even with these prisoners, the Portuguese worried that they were, would not be able to resist an enemy attack because of the lack of residents in the city. And all of this was compounded by the vast majority, by the fact that the vast majority of the Muslim population of Quetta simply left, and so the city had entered a sharp decline. By 1426, even one of Henrique's bastard half-brothers was writing publicly of the folly of keeping Queda. King John convinced the Pope to grant the diocese in Queda in 1419, which purportedly had spiritual command not over not just Queda, but over all of Morocco and Granada, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, if you'll recall. Yet, even as late as 1444, the diocese still had not a single endowment, and as a result, no priests or other clergy resided in the city, and which also probably did not help persuade the public opinion. Now, at any rate, the first governor of Queda, who reported directly to Henrique's name, uh, excuse me, the first governor who reported directly to Henrique was named Pedro de Menezes, and, well, that's definitely wrong. And he, he could have used a lot more help, especially in the form of reinforcements, because already by 1419, he was dealing with the first of several counterattacks by Moroccan and Granadan forces, which threatened the colony. Now, Henrique did send reinforcements, and although the nearby mountain Mont Albion was overrun in this first attack, the fortress held. Henrique got into the corsairing business by the 1420s, in part to defend Queda, but mostly, I presume, to get rich by stealing and kidnapping people. Now, he'd outfitted a number of ships whose captains and crews weren't always particularly keen about making sure the ships they attacked were operated by Muslims, either. One of his ships, captained by an alleged holy man, Fray Goncalo Vejo, attacked a Galatian ship on the Mediterranean in 1425. Veljo was a friar in the Order of Christ, which was headed by Henrique. Veljo will also further distinguish himself in a few more years as one of the colonizers of the Azores. So, while for Portugal, as a whole, the conquest of Queda is a huge waste of blood and treasure, this is not the case for Henrique and some of his fellow conquistadors, you know, the Fidalgos of Portugal. This experience itself actually makes a lot of them more familiar with seafaring, and as a result, the conquistadors became corsairs, and thus were able to use Queda as a base from which to launch attacks to enrich themselves. And Henrique was involved in the administration of Queda personally until the 1450s, a period of over 35 years. Now, Henrique also became appointed head of the Order of Christ in 1420, by his father uh, after re returning from Queda. Now, the Order of Christ, mind you, is one of the successor organizations of the Knights Templar. Uh, the experience uh, Henrique gains running this military order will also obviously aid his ambitions uh, equally as will his familiarity with the caravel and other naval technologies. 
um, since it is from the ranks of this medieval organization born out of the need to organize crusaders that Henrique recruits the knights and squires who will lead expeditions to Africa, a pursuit that will dominate Henrique's life from thereafter. Now, Henry doesn't just benefit from being in charge of a bunch of young, ambitious knights, since either, since throughout the rest of his life, he will use the chair, he will also use the treasury of the Order of Christ, basically as his own personal bank account. Um, now, Henrique is not, as we have spoken about, the first or even uh, the first or even the first prince to have more than just a passing interest in sailing to Sub-Saharan Africa. But he's merely the first very wealthy prince to have done so, um, with direct knowledge of, of, of a little bit of how things worked. Now, the incredible successes of the reconquest of Portugal in preceding generations made Portugal, uh, as well as, you know, obviously the other Iberian Christian kingdoms, some of the wealthiest places in Christendom. And so, as a result, um, you know, Henrique could afford all of this. Now, because he became the Order of the Head of Christ and the head of the Casa de Queda, uh, he was able to build quite a substantial fortune. And in addition, uh, you know, all of this kind of was largely based on piracy. Uh, he also made a, a decent amount of money operating a soap monopoly throughout the empire as well. And his exploits afterwards, though, can be seen as a showing of, quote, show shaggy swagger, unquote, says Felipe Fernandez Armesto, who is the author of Before Columbus, um, and just has some of the greatest phrases, showy, shaggy swagger. He called Henry an early form of grocer's capitalist. Uh, born a prince who would never be king, he desperately wanted the sort of wealth that control of the gold trade promised. He saw conflict with the infidel as more important than war with Christians, and thus he saw himself as a holy warrior. But his Christianity was in many ways also propaganda, because despite his possession, position as head of the Order of Christ, Henrique did not put any funding into spreading the faith until the very end of his life, when he, I'm sure, was very worried. And most of the friars and the others working in the African Atlantic after the Portuguese began to open this world up to Europeans were actually Castilians. And few of those held... Uh, had much regard for the piety of their Portuguese partners. Now, Fernandez Armesto further reminds us that not only uh, should we maybe question Henrique's stated motives, as, as are stated by um, uh, Zerara, but maybe even a little bit his importance to history. Gomez Inz de Zerara purposefully chose Henry as his hero, diminishing the actions and ruling of his brother Duarte, who is the king of Portugal during most of the Henrican voyages that are going to follow, um, you know, after King John dies. Zerara says that amongst the infant's motivations was detached curiosity about the world and crusading fervor. But only one of these motivations is backed up by any other evidence except for Zerara, and thus these motives have passed through history. Uh, but we don't really know if he actually felt any crusading fervor, since he put no resources into missionary work. So if we are going to argue that Henry Gay felt a scientific curiosity about the world that was detached from being, did, did, that was detached from his intense greed, um, then we will probably also have to take Zerara at his word about some of other, Henry Gay's other uh, motivations, which included astrology. In fact, according to Zerara, Henry always consulted his horoscope in regards to making decisions, and in fact, it was his chief motivation above all the others. Um, Henrique, now, Henrique adopted one of his brother's sons when it became necessary. And of all the things I may say about the prince, he seems to me to have been, I guess, a, a pretty honorable family man, caring towards his friends, likewise for his nephew. The numerous, uh, or excuse me, likewise for his nephew, the numerous squires and unruly knights under Henrique's command were paid for by him at uh, an extensive cost. And that cost went beyond just money, since uh, these wild conquistadors seem to have committed no shortage of crimes, if we are to judge by Portuguese legal records, 
And Henrique gave his men numerous pardons for crimes like murder and rape. And I want to bring this up because I want to remember that nobody's perfect. And likewise, nobody's perfectly rotten. Henrique does have a loyal side to him, and on a broader point, more than just Henrique or any of these conquistadors, I want to state that, despite all the terrible Europeans I'm talking about, that there are actually some, I guess, quote unquote, air quotes, good people in Portugal and Spain during this era. If um, It's just that the good people of Portugal and Spain aren't the same ones who were going out on ships with swords and cannons to kidnap children. Now, so by the 1420s, the Dom Henrique has obtained revenue streams from the Casa de Queda and the Order of Christ, and he's using this to finance a fleet of carabels, which are basically operating as corsairs uh, and giving him a third stream of revenue. And in addition, the conquest of Queda gave Henrique knowledge that he'd gained about uh, from the African gold and slave trade, and as well as the experience administering the colony. Now, Zurara writes that as a result of all of this, Henrique thus had six reasons for spending the rest of his life in pursuit of conquest in Africa. Now, now first, uh, quote, Henrique was stirred up by his zeal for the service of God and the king, unquote. So just so we're clear, this is not selfishness. Now, the second reason was that if there were chance to be in those lands some population of Christians or some ha ha havens into which it would be possible to sail without peril, many kinds of merchandise might be brought to this realm, which would find a ready market, and reasonably so, because no other people of these parts traded with them, which traffic would bring great profit to our countrymen. Now the third reason, Zerara continues, is Quote, as it is said that the power of the Moors in the land of Africa was very much greater than was commonly supposed, and that there were no Christians among them, nor any other race of men, and because every wise man is obliged by natural prudence to wish for a knowledge of the power of his enemy, therefore the infant exerted himself to cause this to be fully discovered, and to make it known determinately how far the power of these infidels extended." Unquote. The fourth reason was that Henrique sought to know if there were in those parts any Christian princes in whom the charity and love of Christ was so ingrained that they would aid him against those enemies of the faith. The fifth reason was his great desire to make increase of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and to bring to him all the souls that should be saved. So basically, besides reason number two, which is an economically based argument centering on, hey, we'll all get rich here in Lisbon if we try to start trading in Africa, the reasons for Henrique's interest in Africa are all rooted in notions of chivalry. So you can see how I would argue that when historians spend time arguing over whether or not the conquistadors were motivated mostly by greed or mostly by faith, I would argue that it's a pointless argument because to these conquistadors, they were sort of the same thing. I, like I said, God's favor was shown by successful conquest in the form of booty captured as the result of that conquest. Now, with that said, Zerara's sixth stated reason kind of throws a monkey wrench into the whole idea of Henrique as a pious Christian crusader, because the sixth, reason state, uh, sixth stated reason is unequivocally blasphemous, especially to his contemporaries. Now, and that is because the sixth stated reason over and above the five previous reasons, says Zurara, was that, quote, the inclination of the heavenly wheels meant African conquest was Henrique's destiny. Now, unquote. That, that's right. The crusading prince was also practicing astrology and believed firmly that his destiny lie in the conquest of Africa. Now, personally, I think that's all a little funny, but I should also state that Henrique was by no means alone in European royal and, and noble world at the time in, in this belief in astrology. Uh, but I think this does teach us something, which is that, A, well, two things, I guess. A, this is yet another example of how magic was real in the world in the 15th century. And it also says, I think, something about how people are complicated, and we should just keep that in mind. Now, Henrique began using his wealth with overseas colonialism and wealth to colonize the uninhabited island of Madeira by 1425, or at least that was his story. Zerara claimed that two of Henrique's squires discovered the islands in 1420, though considering that European maps had 
been showing the islands uh, a century early, uh, earlier. The expedition to the uninhabited islands was more of a rediscovery at best. Um, at any rate, Zerara's writing might have been a little, or date might have been a little premature as well, and might have been more of a publication of colonial strategy uh, on Henrique's behalf. Uh, at any rate, afterwards, Henrique did supply the two men with whatever supplies they required to transform this island into an agricultural colony. But whether that happened on the initial 1425 uh, uh, voyage or a subsequent voyage, we're, we're not entirely sure. Now, we do know for a fact that in June and July of 1439, settlers... Uh, were sent to Madeira, and at least one of the Azores, along with sheep and seed for planting. The initial attraction for Henrique and the Portuguese was the ample timber on the island. Madeira itself is a Portuguese word for wood, and before the settlement by the Portuguese, the island was called Timber Island on maps. Timber was a rare resource in Portugal, and the effect that the colony on Madeira and the effect that the colony on Madeira had on the nation of the 15th century cannot be overstated. The average home in Portugal gained a story in height as a result of the more plentiful resource. During the first years of colonization, Henrique farmed out this enterprise to intermediate lords, a strategy that would soon be repeated in the coastal fortresses of the, that the Portuguese would construct off the coast of Africa, and enabled the Portuguese to fully reap the benefits of trade by entering into a partnership with private enterprise with lords whose grants of land were made contingent upon their inducing settlers to populate their lands. The island's colonial population was further supplemented with the convicted criminals, the strategy that the Portuguese had previously used in Queda, no shortage of exiled fidalgos, many from Henrique's own household, served some time on Madeira and the Azores, and, and as a result, these colonial societies uh, become a 15th century version of the Wild West, like a form of gunslinger's law, or in this case, I guess, crossbowman's uh, law, was the rule of the day. And nothing better exemplifies this atmosphere than the case of two Portuguese fidalgos who were living on Madeira in 1452. Diago de Barados, a Fidalgo in Henrique's service, had been exiled to Madeira, where he served in the household of Tristão del Ilha as a knightly retainer, performing, quote, honor and vassalage, unquote. Diago used this opportunity to seduce Tristão's daughter, and when Tristão found out about this, he cut off his Johnson, and after that had Diago flung into the, John into the dungeon. Fernandez Armesto called Madeira and the Azores, quote, a strange world of mingled savagery and civility, a society of courtly aspirations and crude, desperate reality, unquote. And I, I think that's also a kind of a great way to describe parts of the American West in the mid-19th century, you know, is it not? Now, Madeira being unpeopled and full of a needed resource was an economic success story as far as the as colonies go, immediately. But this initial success would eventually pr prove to be part of a boom and bust cycle that will be repeated in var to varying degrees in numerous other overseas European colonies henceforth. Now, a source whom we will be later getting into in much greater detail uh, next episode... Catamasto, reported that by the 1450s, two principal crops were grown in Madeira, wine and sugar. And by Henrique's death in 1460, the island's wineries and sugar plantations were ma major contributors to his treasury. All of this came at the expense of Madeira's ecosystem. As you might imagine, the Portuguese put zero emphasis on conservation of the timber, which made all of this possible. Um, since in addition to the really nice homes and other buildings m being constructed in Portugal, uh, as a result of the Madeiran colonists cutting down trees, the sugar mills themselves on Madeira acquired quite a bit of lumber to construct, and it, it wasn't until 1515 that the Portuguese crown eventually started to regulate the cutting of trees of Madeira. Uh, and by this point, the, the, the soil, the agricultural output, was um, it just wasn't as good either. Uh, mono cult, you know, mono agriculture is not great for uh, land. The colonists at Madeira did not have it easy. Now, with that said, they lived in small huts 
constructed of wood, thatched with hay or other plants, and they slept on the floor. However, they were given free grants of land if they were able to bring said land to, into cultivation within a period of ten years. Forests, pastures, and streams on the island were held in common, which was another benefit for would-be uh, settlers. After the death of his father, Henrique assumed a much greater control of the island than previously when in 1433 his brother Duarte, the new king, donated full control of the islands to him. Madeira was also governed as two separate territories, a result of a dispute between the two squires who had originally discovered and henceforth governed the island. Now, the colony also had an international flavor to it. Uh, Henrique, Henrique purposefully courted Genoans, Venetians, and other traders from Italy and elsewhere in Europe, and let it be known uh, throughout the continent that they could purchase sugar from Madeira. Now, both Madeira and the Azores were able to survive the dangerous early years of being a young colony, and they rapidly established a stable, economically successful basis of life. This was possible both because of the profitability of sugar and wine and to the granting of privileges to the colonists. The Portuguese granted monopolies to colonists on the industries of mining, watering, and salting on the islands, and these concessions gave plenty of motivation for the Portuguese nobility and merchants on, uh, with the money to invest in these sort of ventures. Now, these early colonies were intimately connected with the Canary Islands. While the bulk of the population of Madeira and the Azores were made up of the Portuguese peasantry, Canarian slaves began taking on specialized roles of herdsmen and sugar mill staff. Madeira specifically experienced spectacular economic growth, and by the 1480s, though, uh, and by, excuse me, by the 1480s, it was contributing heavily to the Portuguese economy. While everyone today thinks of Madeira wines, and the Madeira grape was transported to the island by the Portuguese during the 15th century, sugar really was the key here, and Henrique was heavily involved in the earliest stages of the Atlantic sugar industry. He was not alone. Key to was an additional investment, and even more importantly, expertise in the form of Genoan merchant families, which themselves had become familiar with sugar production during the late medieval period. And they, and they were not alone. Other Italians familiar with the sugar industry also emigrated to Madeira. The Azores, though smaller, still had some lands suitable for sugar cultivation, though in this region it was actually mainly Flemish merchants who provided the ne necessary capital to start up sugar plantations. Now, Henrique was key to all of this working. In addition to his own investments, he was a partner in the building of the first recorded sugar mill on Madeira in 1452. Henry's importance in fighting for and providing an overall legal framework, albeit one based just on conquest, gave all those merchants and would-be sugar barons the protection necessary for them to be willing to take the risks what use is sinking your entire fortune into transporting your business, your family, and going to a foreign land at tremendous cost, if it is possible, maybe even likely, that pirates are going to show up and steal all of your sugar, all of your slaves, all of your sons and daughters, and leave you to put out the fire from your home, at, from your home uh, so it isn't burned down? Well, that still might happen to you if Madeira is operating under the protection of the Portuguese Empire, but it is less likely... And at least the pirates, who are Portuguese, almost certainly won't bother you. Madeira and the Azores further greatly benefited the new trade routes opening up in Africa, since they provided excellent bases that the Portuguese ships could use to resupply on return ships home from Africa. So, Madeira was basically able to function thus as a free enterprise zone. And so did the Azores, and to a lesser extent, parts of the Canary Islands. The parts that had been conquered up to that point, I should say, where European mercantile capital, much of it concentrated at this time in Italy and the Netherlands, and and I should say it's not completely free. One fifth of all wealth generated on Madeira uh, was, for example, was to go to Henrique. But other than that, there really weren't a whole lot of rules which these colonizing conquistadors are operating under. These aren't the feudal estates of Europe, steeped in hundreds of years of law and tradition, where the rulers of those lands and the peasants of those lands worked in a partnership. This was something different. In Madeira and the Azores in particular, 
the land was unoccupied. There were literally no restrictions on use by the colonists, and so the Fidalgos and merchants who obtained land on Madeira began to experiment with different ways to increase the profitability of sugarcane, and one way they experimented was with labor. At first, the primary labor force on Madeira and the Azores were European peasants who emigrated to the new islands, but enslaved Canarians were also used for specialized roles as shepherds and herdsmen, and soon afterwards into the most dangerous roles of sugar production. By the 1460s, Madeira's labor force was almost entirely composed of enslaved persons, from the Canary Islands mainly, though as time went on from there, also increasingly from Africa, as Portugal became more and more connected with the African slave trade, and which is a, a process that we're going to be talking about a lot more in our next episode. Now, in 1439, Henrique asked for permission from his brother, the king, to settle those islands, which he received, and then in 1443, the king granted the settlers there an exemption for a period of five years from the obligation to pay the traditional taxes on goods exported from the Azores to Portugal. Now, unlike Madeira, the smaller Azores were not an immediate economic boom colony, at least not nearly to the extent of the huge forested island. But the Azores did eventually also become a location of numerous sugar plantations, as well as a major supplier of woad, a type of dye grown on the island. Uh, the waters of the Azores additionally were teeming with life, and before long, the island chain became a commercial hub for the shipping, for the excuse me, for the fishing and whaling industries. Now. After Henrique received word that French and Castilian settlers were living on the Canary Islands, he became obsessed with having the Portuguese obtain a dominant position there. But despite all his successes in peopling Madeira, the Azores, and developing new trade routes with numerous African peoples, the Canary Islands became a great bugaboo for Henrique and the Portuguese. He sent numerous islands to the island chain, numerous armies, excuse me, to the island chain combating both the F Spanish and French conquistadors as well as the native Guanche people. The first attempt Henrique made at, the att at, at a conquest of the Canaries was in 1425, when he sent an army to the Grand Canary. The expedition was a complete disaster, though we know almost nothing about it except for that it occurred. Henrique's chronicler Zerara did not mention it in his chronicles at all, an obvious attempt, given other records that do exist to erase the memory of the Portuguese getting their asses handed to them by a bunch of stone-aged savages, I should say. Air quotes in that s savage thing. For 30 years, Henrique continued to send expeditions to the Canaries, and for 30 years they failed. Peter Russell, Henrique's biography, wondered how much farther south of the coast of Guinea might have been reconnoitered if Henrique had instead focused more attention on sending expeditions to Africa instead of the Canaries. Now, I want to save most of our discussion of the Portuguese going into sub-Saharan Africa for next episode, um, after introducing uh, the people who live there. Um, but with that said, it is impossible to discuss Henry the Navigator without talking about what he is most famous for, which are the African voyages. And so um, we're going to, with the help of Zorara now, uh, dive pretty deeply in uh, into those at any rate. Um, now, since Henrique was the first European prince to, to successfully send ships beyond what the Portuguese called Cape Bojador, the Cape of No Return, um, and from there on, they sent subsequent voyages farther and farther south, which connected to Portugal and African states, which beforehand had only been connected through an ancient network of middlemen that sent luxury goods through secret routes of the Sahara. So, with Zerara as our guide, we're going to venture deep into the chronicle of the discovery and conquest of Guinea. Now, although now that I mention it, as a brief aside, that is a terrible title since neither of those things happened. They were attempted, they just weren't successful. Well, I should say the conquest was attempted. Um, it just wasn't successful. But Zarara knows what all great publicists know, which is that a well-placed lie sure can help you sell a book. Now, the issue 
of slavery within Africa as it existed before the Portuguese is an, also an interesting topic and an important one that we're going to have to take some time to unpack next episode. But for now, let me go ahead and state that for reasons of African politics, the institution of human slavery was very prevalent in Africa before the introduction of European conquistadors onto the history of the continent. Now, with that said, just because some African rulers were willing to sell slaves to Europeans... The men themselves who went south to Africa from Portugal had no intention of merely confining themselves to legitimate trade, if I may borrow that term. Um, the Portuguese intended on capturing and conquering first and resorting to trade if that was impossible. Here is Peter Russell, quote, The caravels each carried small numbers of bowmen and other soldiers under the command of a squire, or occasionally of a knight whom Henry wished to favor. They were under orders to wage war against any inhabitants they found on land in West Africa and to seize captives whenever they could. Another task of the squire commanders was to see that the professional seamen, of who, whom we hear so little, duly carried out the prince's sailing orders, however risky they reckoned these to be. Unquote. As Urara claimed, that Henrique believed sailors to be too superstitious and set in the routine ways to make good explorers. Now, as for where all that superstition stemmed from, uh, the Cape Bojador was a place on the West African coast which Europeans believed to be full of evil magic. Azurara was quick to point out that this belief was not derived from cowardice or want of good will, but from the novelty of the thing, and the widespread and ancient rumor about this cape that it had been cherished by the mariners of Spain from generation to generation. And he continued that, quote, there was great doubt as to who would be the first to risk his life in such a venture. How are we, men said, to pass the bounds that our fathers set up? Or what profit can result to the infant from the perdition of our souls as well as of our bodies. For of a truth, by daring any further, we shall come willful murderers of ourselves. Unquote. Now, Zurara also points out that the infant was not the first prince to be curious about what lay beyond the Cape of Bojador, but unlike his predecessors and his contemporaries, for that matter, Henrique's ex specific experience as a semi-successful crusader in Queda and his following career as a CEO of a Portuguese corsairing empire meant that Henrique didn't just have the ships necessary to attempt such an attack. He had enough direct knowledge of Africa necessary uh, to see the potential honor and profit which might be gained beyond the sands of Libya, which itself was a place where there was no water, no tree, no green herb, and the sea so shallow that a whole league from land is only a fathom deep, while the currents are so terrible that no ship, having once passed the Cape, will ever be able to return. Now, I should add that the recent discovery by Europeans just a couple of generations earlier of the uh, quote-unquote the little wheel maneuver, which uh, depended on knowledge of the countervailing trade winds that made a return trip by, uh, from Africa by sea possible, uh, now, and uh, that also made this possible. And Zurara, uh, on, on another point, Zurara was well aware of the attempted trip of the Vivaldi brothers. And, and here, he was basically purposefully pretending as if no one had gone to beyond Cape Bojador before. Um, and I'm basically just finally just add, I'd real quick, that the reason he's able to get away with this is because the Vivaldi brothers did not return. And actually, this is a perfect example of the phrase that winners get to write the history books. Which, I guess, lucky for me, I'm not writing a history book. I'm writing, hosting a podcast. Now, the danger associated with the trip beyond the Cape Bojador, both real and imagined, despite the attempt by the Vivaldi and whoever else might have tried, nevertheless, that did keep most people away from trying. Zarara noted that, quote, as they knew not... As they knew not how to set African lands down by the charts, by which method man controls all the seas that can be navigated, what sort of a ship's captain would be he who, with such doubts placed before him by those 
to whom he might reasonably yield credence and authority, and with such certain prospect of death before his eyes, could venture the trial of such a bold feat as that. It was not easy finding such a captain, according to our chronicler. Quote, for twelve years the infant steadily continued at this labor of his, ordering out his ships every year to those parts, not without great loss of revenue, and never finding any who dared to make that passage. Yet they did not return wholly without honor, for as an atonement for their failure to carry out more fully their lord's wishes, some made descents upon the coast of Granada, and others voyaged along the Levant seas, where they took great booty of the infidels, which they then returned to the kingdom very honorably. Now, I imagine more than a few also made voyages to the Canaries as well, perhaps also Madeira or the Azores, and I point out, because all of this is going on at the same time, the first military expeditions to the Canaries by the Portuguese, constant slave raiding there, and the, at the same time the opening of colonization of Madeira and the Azores are going on, while Henrique sends ships south to Africa. And the Dom probably also had another motive in sending different captives and knights and squires on different missions to Cape Bojador and elsewhere, since the, the practice also worked to prevent any of his knights or squires from obtaining uh, too much personal wealth and power of their own. Uh, he only occasionally sent them back to search again, more often dispatching uh, other picked men from his household. Now, in part, uh, this belief that Cape Bojador was impassable stemmed from the fact that if someone did not understand the currents in the Atlantic, then return by sea to Europe from this point would be impossible. But the belief also seems to have stemmed from an error in translation. The name itself derives from Arabic, um, but it would appear that medieval European mapmakers mistook the Arabic nun, N-U-N, which means fish, for non, N-O-N, which meant literally zero. Because of this, the people that lived around Cape Bojador, who were poor Muslim fisher villages of fishermen, uh, and th these guys were actually also left, uh, looked down upon by their wealthy Arabic co-religionists who lived farther inland, or, or, um, in the, or I should say farther off the Atlantic, not farther inland necessarily, in more urban settings and towns in North Africa. Um, the people of Cape Nun, or Cape Non, however you say it, um, weren't nearly as well connected to uh, the wider Muslim world than many other folks of North Africa. Um, these were just poor fishermen uh, on the coast of Africa. Now, Enrique's ability to send his knights and squires to make it to Cape Bojador gave them enough experience with the area that they became convinced that there was no magic in that place. Um, or at least no breakdown in the laws of physics, anyway, that made the cape or the water at the cape any more or less, more or less dangerous than, than the rest of the ocean sea, I should say. You might say, and I, I would too, that since Enrique did not travel on these voyages, does he really deserve any credit for their success other than his financing? Well, yes and no. And great point, me, as well as any of you who agree with me. I think Enrique does deserve some credit. Not as much as the sailors, mind you, but Enrique probably did believe that Cape Bojador was just a normal place like any other. So this does give him an additional role besides financier, because we have to remember that in the 15th century, magic was very real for most people. And as we discussed earlier, Magic is very real for Henrique, too. It's just not this particular belief. According to Zerara, the first of the Portuguese fidalgos who received patronage from Henrique to travel to Africa was Gil Eanes. Now, I am sure Gil Eanes and Gomez Eanes de Zerara are related in some way, but forgive me, again, as I don't know exactly how, and once again, that I'm not really that interested in geano genealogy to figure it out. I welcome you to look this up for me preferably in an angrily worded rant to the editor. I do apologize that the editor is on vacation, but I assure you that the editor will receive any correspondence in due time, and will perhaps make corrections. Now, at any rate, Azrara writes that at last, after twelve years, the infant armed a barca, and gave it to Gil Eanes, one of his squires, whom he afterwards knighted and cared for right nobly, 
And he followed the same course that others had taken, but touched by the same self-terror, he only went as far as the Canary Islands, where he took some captives and returned to the kingdom. And this was in the year of Jesus Christ, 1433, Gillines got a second chance the next year when the Infant made ready the same vessel. Quote, and calling Gillines apart, charged him earnestly to strain every nerve to pass the Cape. Even if he could do nothing else on that voyage, yet he considered that to be enough. You will find, said the Infant, a peril so great that the hope of re excuse me. Uh, you will find a peril so great that the hope of reward will not be greater. Now, Henrique further went on to blame the fear on rumors uh, uh, by four merchants from Flanders, who, in addition to being foreign and therefore presumably untrustworthy, were also poor mariners and know nothing of the needle or sailing chart. So go on out there, Gillines. Quit being a little bitch, is what Henrique would have added had he lived in the 21st century and spoke English. Now, at any rate... The pep talk must have helped, because Eanes set out after having resolved not to reserve, not to return to the presence of his lord without assured tidings of that for which he was sent. On his second trip, Eanes did pass the Cape of Bojador, quote, despising all danger, and found the lands beyond quite contrary to what he, like others, had expected. Eanes ordered the boats to be put out, and had gone into the shore without finding either people or signs of habitation. He reported to Henrique upon his return. However, he did gather some herbs called Roses of St. Mary, which I assume must have had some measure of value, since he returned with them. Eanes received great honor for the successful journey, though he did not return with the wealth that subsequent voyages would obtain. Now, Henrique must have been pleased uh, for this, for after Eanes finished giving his account, Dom ordered another ship, a baronel, to be made ready, in which he sent out Il Gil Eanes a third time, though now with another knight, Afonso Goncalves Baldaya, Henrique's cupbearer. Thus they returned to Africa, having, quote, passed fifty leagues beyond the Cape, where they found the land without dwellings, but showing footmarks of men and camels, and then, either because they were so ordered, or from necessity, they returned with this intelligence without doing aught else worth recording." Unquote. Now, after the return of the expedition, Zurara records that the Infant spoke to Alfonso Goncalves Baldaya. Quote, As you have found traces of men and camels, it is evident that the inhabitant region cannot be far off, or perchance they are people who cross with their merchandise to some seaport with a secure anchorage for ships to load in. For since there are people, they must of necessity depend upon which the sea brings them, and especially the fish, however bestial they may be, much more so the inland tribes. Therefore I intend to send you there again, in the same baronel, both that you may do me service and increase your honor, and to this end I order you to go as far as you can, and to try to gain an interpreter. Capture one if you can. <laughs> from whom you can obtain tidings of the land, for according to my purpose it will not be a small gain if we can get someone to give us news of this sort. Now the ship was soon ready to sail, and Afonso Goncalves departed with great desire to do the Infant's will. Now this expedition sailed even farther beyond the Cape Bojador, recorded as having reached 120 leagues by Zurara, there, Goncalves found an estuary belonging to a river of good size and with many good anchorages. Goncalves's ship sailed eight leagues upstream and anchored there. He disembarked the two horses which had been given to him by the infant, and upon which were mounted, which he mounted two youths, which he then ordered to ride and scout ahead, looking carefully for villages or people traveling by some path. Goncalves ordered that the two teens, quote, take no arms of defense in order to cause them and their horses less fatigue, but only their lances and swords to attack if needed. For if they came upon people who can't, tried to capture them, their best remedy would be in the horse's feet, unless they found one man alone of whom they might make use without danger. Unquote. And this, I might add, is really kind of the spirit of chivalry put boldly put into action. Older men convincing younger men to kill and kidnap so that they can get rich. 
Now the two boys, neither of them more than seventeen years of age, set out boldly and followed the course of the river for a space of seven leagues, says Zerara. There they found nineteen men, all banded together without any arms of offense or de defense, but only assegais. Now the assegai, I should point out, it is a short spear with an iron or steel tip, about three to four feet long, common in Africa, is deadly, lightweight, and cheap, so it was a great weapon for peasants, but it was far less effective than the uh, swords used by uh, the wealthier Portuguese fidalgos. Now, at any rate, uh, as soon as the youths saw them, they attacked with great courage, says Zerara. Um, the shocked fishermen, though so many in number, dared not meet them on the level, but rather for security retired to some rocks, where they fought with the youths for a good space. And during the fight one of those youths was wounded in the foot, and although the wound was slight it did not remain unavenged, for they wounded one of the enemy likewise, and they kept on fighting until the sun began to give warning of light, on which account they went back to their ship. Now, and it's really astonishing to me how Zerara is to make this sound more heroic than it is, which is basically an attempted kidnapping. Um, and, and really, check out Zerara's armchair general commentary after this. Quote, I am sure that the injuries of the combat would not have been so small if the enemy had remained upon the ground, unquote. Yeah, likely. Yeah. Well, great observation. The next day, as soon as it was light, Afonso Goncalves had the boat made ready, and putting himself and some of his people into it, he followed the course of that river, sending the youths on horseback along by the land till he reached the place where the Moors had bound the other day. He intended to fight with them and capture some, but their toil was in vain, for so great was the alarm the natives were possessed with a great fear and had departed as a result of the previous encounter with the two youths. They had left behind, though, the greater portion of their poor belongings, which Afonso Goncalves loaded into his boat, and seeing that it would not per profit to pursue any further, he then returned to the ship. Now, without having captured any captives, though, Goncalves still had a lot of room in the hold of his ship, and so when he saw on the bank at the entrance of the river a great multitude of sea wolves, the estimate of some were about 5,000. He caused his men to kill as many as they could, and with their skins loaded into his ship, an easy task because they were very easy to kill, the men made great, very, very great slaughter amongst those wolves, uh, apparently. Um, Goncalves was able to make a little money, I guess, but he, he wasn't done, because he then showed the true conquistador spirit. Someone must have said Mas Aya. Because he was not satisfied, because he had not taken one of the moors, so he sailed further south another fifty leagues to see if he could make captive some man, woman, or child by which to satisfy the will of his lord, and came to a point where stood a rock which from a distance was like a galley, and for this reason they called that port from that day forward the port of the galley. They went on land where they found some nets which they took on board, Zurara reports that the thread of those nets was composed of the bark of a tree, so well fitted for such a use that without any other tanning or admixture or of flax it could be woven right excellently. Finally, Afonso Goncalves turned back to Portugal after this, quote, without any certain knowledge as to whether those who lived there were Moors or Gentiles, or as to what life or manner of living they had. This was in the year of Jesus Christ, 1463, unquote. Now, Henrique was undoubtedly somewhat disappointed that Goncalves did not return with any captives, but undoubtedly he was still quite pleased because the river uh, Goncalves had discovered was thought to be the, river de, the Rio de Oro. So Henrique believed it wouldn't be long before all of the riches of Africa would be his. Now, I'm not 100% sure uh, what river Goncalves is talking about, um, but... It's probably the River Senegal. Um, now, or something before that. Uh, later, uh, later, definitely later voyages of the, of, this, of the Portuguese will also be thinking they reached the Rio de Oro. And uh, they, they, what they're talking about is the River Senegal. At any rate. Um, now... 
Henrique was eager to send subsequent voyages to Africa, and but that would have to wait for some time, because in the years that followed, from 1436 to 1441, the Portuguese crown, Henrique, and pretty much everyone else with any money and a conquistadoring spirit was distracted by an attempted invasion of Tangier, which is another Moroccan city on the Mediterranean, which ultimately failed spectacularly, uh, and it ultimately ended in the death of Don Edward, one of Henrique's brothers. As a result, Henrique only sent two ships down the African coastline during that five-year period, one to fetch more of the sea wolves from the Rio de Oro, while the other encountered bad weather and was forced to return to Portugal, having never reached Africa. Now, in 1441, Henrique sent another voyage to Africa, this time under the direction of Antum Goncalves, who is related to Afonso Goncalves, but as I stated earlier, I do not have enough interest in genealogy to figure out exactly how. At any rate, Antum was Henrique's chamberlain, not his cupbearer, as Afonso had been. Now, Antum, in 1441, was apparently older than most of the captains of Henrique's ships, and because of this, according to Zarara, Henrique actually had less hope in a positive result than he'd had with some of his previous voyages. But this did not stop him, apparently. After he had accomplished his voyage and gotten a big load of sea wolf skins in the hold of his ship, and I should say this did not stop uh, Antum, I should say, uh, from trying to inspire his crew to further toil. He stated his desire that they ought to labor more strenuously to achieve something which had been laid upon them as a charge by the Infant Our Lord. Antum Goncalves stated his plan to accomplish just that as well. Quote, I would fain go myself this next night with nine men of you, those who are the most ready for this business, and prove a part of this land along the river to see if I find any inhabitants, for I think we of right ought to meet with some since it is certain there are people here who traffic with camels and other animals that bear their freights. Unquote. Now this they did. Antum and nine of his men traveled on the land for a space of three leagues, before they found the footprints of men and youths, the number of whom, according to their estimate, would be from forty to fifty. And these led the opposite way from where the Portuguese men were going. But now in the heat, which was very intense, which began to take its toll on the conquistadors, and so by this, and by the want of water, which they apparently did not have any of, Antip Goncalves gave another pep talk to his men, and after that they returned back to the sea. On the return journey, though, they saw a naked man following a camel, after having gone a short distance. He carried two isages in his hand, and ran from the conquistadors, who chased, not one who felt aught of his great fatigue during the encounter. The naked man stopped after a short case. Chase, excuse me. Quote, Though he was only one, and saw the others were many, he had a mind to prove those arms of his right worthily, and began to defend himself as best he could, showing a bolder front than his strength warranted. But Afonso Guterres, one of the conquistadors, wounded him with a javelin, and this put him the more in such a fear that he drew down his arms like a beaten thing. And after they had captured him, to their no small delight, and had gone on further, they espied, on the top of the hill, the company whose tracks they were following, and their captive pertained to the number of these. And they failed not to reach them through any lack of will, but the sun was now low, and they wearied, so they determined to return to their ship, considering that such enterprise might bring greater injury than profit. Now as they were going their way, they saw a black morris come along, who was a slave of those upon the hill, and though some of our men were in favor of letting her pass to avoid a fresh skirmish, for since the enemy was in sight and their number more than doubled the conquistadors, despite this, Antum Goncalves bade them go at her, for he said if they scorned that encounter, it might make their foes pluck up courage against them. Thus, Antum's men, Antum's men did steal the woman, and when her master saw that, they rushed to her defense. But when they saw the conquistadors ready to receive the charge, they turned their backs. After this, Antum Goncalves returned to his ship and made his way back to Portugal, where he knew as a reward for, his, for being the first of Henrique's corsairs to return with captives from Africa, he would receive a knighthood. He just had to get back first. And so that made the encounter he's about to have a little dicey, because when he Antum's ship makes it back to the river, to the mouth of the river, 
they see another fully armed caravel, which the most advanced piece of military technology of the day. Uh, undoubtedly, Antum and the other men were quite relieved to discover that this caravel, too, had been sent by Henrique. Now, Zorara tells us that Nuno Tristam, a youthful knight, very valiant and ardent, had been brought up from early boyhood in the infant's privy chamber, had arrived at that very place where was Antum Goncalves, and brought with him an armed caravel with a special command of his lord, that he should pass beyond the port of the galley and go as far as he could, and that he should bestir himself as well to capture some of the people of the country as best he could. Nuno Tristam arrived and met Antum Goncalves, and you can well imagine how great was the joy of these two, being natives of the same kingdom and brought up in one and the same court, to meet again at so great a distance from their own land. Nuno Tristam had brought along an enslaved Arab woman, and that said she should speak with one of those captives, which Antum had captured, to see if they could one understand one another as it would be of great profit to know all the state and conditions of the people of that land. And so all three of them, Nuno, Antum, and the Arab interpreter, spoke, but their language was very different from that of the others, and so they were not able to understand each other. While the conquistadors could gain no additional knowledge from their captives this, in this way, Nuno Tristam was quite eager to hear about the whereabouts of exactly where Antum Goncalves had captured his captives. Now, after that, after Goncalves debriefed Nuno Tristam, uh, Tristam asked Goncalves to help him raid the same area the next night, saying that if both of them provided ten men, they ought to capture them all, whom Goncalves had already encountered, since according to him they numbered no more than twenty fighting men, the rest women and children. And besides, Nuno argued, even if they did not meet with the very same, they shall surely find others whom they could make as good a booty, perhaps even better. Goncalves was hesitant, but some of the other knights on board were enthusiastic enough that the mission proceeded. Zurara enlightens us to the action that went ahead. Quote, and so it chanced that in the night where they came to where the natives lay scattered in two encampments, either the same that Antum Goncalves had found before or other like it, the distance between the encampments was but small, and our men divided themselves into three parties, in order that they might better hit upon them. For they had not yet any certain knowledge of the place where they lay, but only a perception of them. As you can see, like things are perceived much more readily by night than by day. And when our men had come nigh to them, they attacked them very lustily, shouting at the top of their voices, Portugal, y Santiago, the fright of which so abashed the enemy that it threw them all into disorder, and so, in confusion, they began to fly without any order or carefulness, except indeed that the men made some show of defending themselves with their assegais, for they knew not the use of any other weapon, especially one of them, who fought face to face with Nuno Tristam, defending himself until he received his death blow. And besides this one, whom Nuno Tristam slain, and others killed, three and took ten prisoners, of what men, women, and boys... It is not to be doubted that they would have been slain that they would have slain and taken many more had they all fallen on together at the first onslaught. But among those who were taken there was one greater than the rest, who was called Adahu, and he was said to be noble. And this I should add, as we'll remember, is a great prize in the world of crusading, since nobility uh, had the resources for their friends and family, uh, or you know, they had the resources or their friends and family have the resources to be ransomed off. Um, and this makes his, Adahu's capture especially valuable to the Portuguese. Now, afterwards, the Portuguese called that place the Port of the Cavalier. Um, also afterwards, Nuno Tristam had the Arab translator speak with the captives. Again, they could not communicate, uh, which Zurara tells us because the people were not Moorish, which is a, actually a catch-all term for Arabic speakers in this case, um, but Azanagwe of the Sahara. But Adahu, the Azanagwe nobleman, had actually been to other lands where he had learned the Moorish tongue. And so the Arab translator uh, and Adahu was able to speak, and Adahu tried bargaining for his freedom. Now, after this bargaining, the Portuguese put ashore the Arab translator 
and one of the Azanagwe women whom they had captured, and tasked with finding the others, that if they wished to come and speak with them about the ransom of some of those whom they had taken prisoners, or about traffic and merchandise, they might do so. And at the end of two days, there came to that place about 150 moors on foot, and 35 on horses and camels, bringing the enslaved translator back with them. The approaching moors, however, sought to ensnare their enemies of a tra in a trap of their own, for only three of them appeared on the shore, and the rest lay in ambush. And to that end, the Portuguese, being unaware of the treachery, might land, and when they could, and after they did so, the other men would seize them, um, which is something they would have been able to do probably through sheer force of numbers. But the, the Portuguese did discover the did see the Moors, and the Moors, perceiving that their wiles were discovered, because they saw that the men in the boat turned about on seeing that the slave did not appear, revered their dissembling tricks, and came into sight of the shore, says Zarara, hurling stones and making gestures of defiance. The failure of the attempted setup was really bad news for Adahu, because afterwards neither side was willing to trust the other, and that meant that no matter how wealthy he was, it wasn't enough to get him free. Now, Zerara tells us that after the near ambush, the Portuguese turned back to the ships where they made their partition of the captives. Now, according each got according to his lot, and the Moors betook themselves to their encampments, taking the Arab with them. And after this episode, Anton Goncalves finally returned to Portugal. Now, Nuno Tristam stuck around to make more captures, but shortly afterwards the, uh, of, the ent of the departure of Antum Goncalves and his ship, he realized his own ship needed repairs, and so most of the remaining time he spent there was uh, spent doing that. Uh, he caused the sailors to beach her, careening and, and mending her as was needful, uh, before uh, finally returning, finding nothing more other than more traces of men and fishing nets. Now, as you can imagine, though, Henrique was a pretty happy guy when some of his pirates returned from this voyage with slaves. Great celebrations were had upon the return of Antum Goncalves and the small wealth he brought back with him, small wealth in quotes. Uh, Zorara tells us that, quote, justly may I call it small in comparison of the great joy derived solely from that one holy purpose to seek salvation for the lost souls of the heathen. As Zurara continues that even with how great Antum Gonzalves and his men and Henrique were all feeling, and how drunken their revelry essentially was, yet the greater benefit belonged to the newly enslaved. For though their bodies were now brought into some subjection, this was but a small matter in comparison to their souls, which would now possess true freedom forevermore. Similar celebrations were repeated again when Nuno Tristam arrived, with captives shortly afterwards. Now, once everyone sobered up, Henrique, presumably under the direction of his brother, the king, Don Pedro, sent an embassy to the Vatican, since, quote, he had it in his charge to ask from the supreme pontiff things of great importance, which basically amounted to the infant saying, you know, Portugal sure could collect a lot of tithes in Africa for the Holy Church, if only the Pope would uh, declare to all the rest of Christendom that the Portuguese own everything in Africa from Quetta on down. Um, now, the Pope incidentally agreed with Henry and felt that the Portuguese were willing to build some churches in Africa to collect tithes for the Vatican. Well, that if the Portuguese were willing to do that, then sure, of course the Pope could do that. Now, basically, the reason Henrique is doing this is to try and keep his rivals, especially the Castilians, out of Africa, and the profits he was making there, and was con planning to continue on making there via a Portuguese monopoly. So, the Portuguese got their religious justification via papal authority. And more than that, the Pope actually declared a crusade in Africa, replying to the Infants Replus thusly, quote, We do now concede and grant, by apostolic authority, and by the tenor of these present letters, to each and all who shall be engaged in the said war in Africa, complete forgiveness of all their sins, of which they shall be truly penitent at heart, and have been made confession by their mouth. In the aftermath of this political triumph, the king of Portugal, Dom Pedro, granted his brother Henrique the entirety of the one-fifth that would normally be granted to the king, on account of the great expenses he had occurred in the matter. Further, 
Dom Pedro granted that, quote, since by Henrique alone the, his, the discoveries were made and enterprised, that no one should be able to go to newfound parts of Africa without his license, license and a special mandate, unquote. Now, while Henrique was busy solidifying his gains by obtaining legal and religious backing, um, the captured Asanagwe nobleman Adahu, who, remember, was unable to secure his freedom, continued to speak with Antum Concalves in Portugal return, regarding his possible freedom. Now, as a nobleman, Adahu had connections to the Saharan slave trade, and he declared to Antum that he would give for himself five or six blackmores, and also that he said there were among the other captives two youths for whom a like ransom would be given. Besides the great fortune that this will give you, Antum Gonzalves, Adahu argued, the least that they will give for them would be ten moors. And it would be better to save ten souls than three, for though they were black, they had souls like the others. And all the more as these blacks were not of the lineage of the moors, but were Gentiles, and so all the better to bring them into the path of salvation. Antum Gonzalves brought this offer to the infant, who answered by saying yes, and that he not only desired to have knowledge of that land, but also of the Indies, and of the land of Prester John, if he could. So, Antum Goncalves was granted permission to voyage to the lands of Africa, and thus made ready to go with his captives beginning his voyage. But he was met with so great a tempest that he had to return again to Lisbon, whence he set out again. Zerara here takes us an aside to remind us of the international character of the early conquistadoring expeditions, telling us specifically of a man named Balthazar, who served in the household of the Emperor of Germany, who attended this voyage, since he desired to be made a knight, but not without first doing so much for his own honor as merited such a reward. Now, at any rate, um, Antum Goncalves reached, eventually, what he believed to be the Rio de Oro, but was really, definitely, the River Senegal, and there he waited for seven days, without getting any message or even a glimpse of one single inhabitant of that land. But on the eighth day, there arrived a moor seated on a white camel, and another with him, who gave a message that they should wait there, that they should await the others who would come and make the ransom, and on the next day they would appear, as in fact they did. And it was very clear that those youths who were in great honor among them, for a good hundred moors, male and female, were joined in their ransom. And Antum Goncalves received the two cap for his two captives ten blacks, male and female, from various countries. One, Martin Fernandez, the infant's Alpha KK, managing the business between the parties. Now, as a point of fact, I should note that the position of Alpha KK was the uh, a Portuguese term uh, used for the official ransomer of captives that was employed by Henrique, and I am without a doubt mispronouncing it. Uh, but anyway, now really, that should really let you know under what sort of business uh, Henry is engaging in right there, that your business model requires you to hire an official ransomer of captives, is a sign that you actually might be a bad guy. So you might wonder what sort of qualifications, qualifications you might need to become the Infants Alpha KK, and let me tell you, Martin's chief qualifications was that he was a pretty good speaker of Arabic, uh, since Zorara tells us that he had no trouble communicating with the Moors. Now, Antum Goncalves and the rest of his men must have been quite pleased with this exchange, uh, to say nothing of how Adahu and the two noble youths who had just received their freedom must have felt. Um, I say that because, quote, besides the blacks that Antum received, he also got a little gold dust and a shield of oxide and a small number of ostrich eggs, so that one day there were served up at the infant's table three dishes of the same, as fresh and as good as though they had been made the eggs of any other domestic fowl. And we may presume, Zerara adds, that, quote, there were no other Christian princes in this part of Christendom who had dishes like these upon their plates, unquote. Now, the Moorish merchants also told Goncalves a bit about the gold trade as well, uh, though after that discussion, he became disappointed when he attempted to plan a second exchange with them and they did not return. Um, and anyway, uh, Goncalves uh, returned himself to Lisbon, receiving his reward. Incidentally, Azurara uh, tells us that the German knight Balthazar also made it back safely to his own land with great honor and no small largess from the infant. 
Now, the Portuguese voyages to Africa proceeded little by little, says Zerara, by people who took courage to follow that route, some to serve, others to gain honor, honor excuse me, others to, with hope of profit. Though Zerara also hope, notes that increasing your wealth and increasing your honor is the same thing in the crusading mind, uh, at any rate, uh, in the year 1443, the infant caused another caravel to be armed, and bade embark in that noble knight Nuno Tristam with some other people, and pursuing their voyage, they arrived at Cape Branco. And after trying to go further, they passed the said cape about 25 leagues and saw a little island. Now this island would later become Argum, the site of the first Portuguese fortress in coastal Africa. Africa. Now, but for now, Tristram and his men saw twenty-five canoes, which had set out in them and a number of people, naked, as was their ancient custom, says Zerara. The conquistadors first saw the canoes from a distance, and believed that they were large birds, though as they neared, they realized that they were canoes, filled each with three or four naked fishermen. Zerara reports that in response, Nuno Tristram and his men were clothed in a new joy, because they saw with them so placed that they were able to take them, but they were not able to make a large booty because of the smallness of their boat. For when they had hauled fourteen captives into it, with the seven men of the caravel who made up the crew, the boat was so loaded that it could hold no more. As for the other unfortunate fishermen, they were so quick in taking flight that before they arrived at the island, some had perished by drowning in their attempt to escape. Now, before we continue with Zurara's chronicle, I just stop briefly to state that the voyages to Africa, uh, much like previously the uh, invasion of Quetta, were not very popular at home amongst the non-conquistadoring population. Now, if there had been some amount of resistances for adventuring in Morocco with the invasion of Quetta, the idea of sending ships full of Portuguese to unknown lands that would very likely end in a watery grave was very unpopular. According to Zerara, the longer it took for the enterprise to produce results, the more their criticisms grew. The worst of it was that not only plebeian people, but those of higher rank spoke about the issue in a contemptuous way, believing that no profit would come from so much expense and effort. Now, the success of the African voyages, though, silenced most opposition once cargoes of slaves began arriving in Portugal. Many doubters of Henrique's crusade in Africa began to change their minds, according to Zerara, quote, when they, first, when they saw the first Moorish captives brought home and the second cargo that followed these, they became already somewhat doubtful about the opinion they had first expressed, and though renounced it, and altogether renounced it, when they saw the third consignment that Nuno Tristam brought home, captured in so short a time and with so little trouble, and constrained by necessity, they confessed their mistake, considering themselves foolish for not having not known it before. And so they were forced to turn their blame to public praise, for they said it was plain the infant was another Alexander, and, his and their covetousness began to wax greater. And they saw the houses of others began to overflow with male and female slaves and their property increasing, and they thought about the whole matter and began to talk amongst themselves. As a result... More people began to ask the infant for license to go to that land whence came once those Moorish captives. Since Zerara reminds us that no one could go there without an armed ship without the express permission of the infant, um, what she got in addition with the royal fifth. Now, the first of the men who had at first been dubious, but now wished to increase his own honor and fortune in Africa, was a squire named Lancelot, brought up from early youth in the household of the Infant, and was now the Almoraxif for the king in the town of Lagos. I should briefly stop to state that the position of Almoraxif is that of tax collector, so Lancelot was undoubtedly a super popular guy. At any rate, he stirred up some of his friends into action, and with that Lancelot prepared six armed caravels to carry out his purpose, and spoke to the Infant about a license saying that he begged that he would grant it to him, and that he might do him service, as well as obtain honor and profit for himself. And the infant was very glad of this, and at once commanded his banners to be made, and the cross of the order of Jesus Christ, which one of which was for each caravel. Now, this was by far the largest expedition 
sent by Henrique to Africa to this point. Lancerot was the chief captain, um, and with him in the second ship sailed Gil Eanes, who was the first to pass Cape Bojador. Uh, besides them was a man named Stefan Alfonso, a nobleman who uh, later words of uh, Zurara tells us dies in the Canary Islands. Another was John Diaz, a, a, noble, a shipbuilder. The other two were Rodrigo Alvarez and John Bernaldaz. And Zurara tells us all of the captains were very well prepared for the expedition. They arrived at a place called the Isle of Herons and rested there on the eve of Corpus Christus Day and took counsel about their intended actions. They knew that the size and cost of the expedition dictated thus that it would be a great shame to turn back to Portugal without a worthy booty while in possession of such a fleet. They had also learned from the Moors, whom Nuno Tristam brought home, of a place called the island of Nar, which was close by to them, and on which lived a little less than two hundred souls. Excuse me. Lancerot put two men, who had been on previous voyages to Africa, in command of thirty men, and they took the boats and set out from the island where they were at about sunset. Rowing all that night, they arrived at daybreak on the island that they sought. From there, they hugged the shore for some way until they arrived, as it grew light, at a settlement of moors, which was close to the beach, where they collected together all of the people of the island. There they stopped and debated a plan of attack, since the settlement appeared to be around 170 or 180 individuals in all, of whom 50 or 60 looked to be fighting men. The Portuguese decided not to delay any longer, for the day was coming on quickly, and if delayed, the expedition and purpose will be of little avail. Zurara continued, continues, excuse me, and when all this reasoning was done, they looked towards the settlement and saw that the Moors, with their women and children, were already coming as quickly as they could out of their dwellings, because they had caught sight of their enemies. But the conquistadors shouted, St. James, St. George, Portugal, all at once attacked them, killing and taking all that they could, then you might see mothers forsaking children, and husbands their wives, each striving as best to escape he could. Some drowned themselves in the water. Others thought to escape by hiding under their huts. Others stowed their children among seaweed, where our men found them afterwards, hoping they would escape notice. And at last our Lord, good Lord God, who giveth a reward for every good deed, willed that for the toil they had undergone in his service, that should they that day they should that day obtain victory over their enemies as well, as a payment for their labor and expense. For they took captive of those Moors, what with men, women, and children, one hundred and sixty five, besides those that had perished or had been killed. And when the battle was over, all praised God for the great mercy he had shown them in that he had willed them to give them such a victory, when with so little damage to themselves. Zurara goes on to describe that in the aftermath of the battle, and I say that in air quotes because it seems to me more like a massacre, uh, that the amount of people taken was such that transporting them from the village to the boats and from there to the caravels was an all-day event. By the time the deed was finished, it was already late, and the deed was all the greater by reason of the distance of the caravels from the scene of the action and the great number of moors. Well, that's what Zarara says. After this, the men rested and enjoyed themselves, as was the share of their toil required. But Lancerot did not forget to learn from the moors' prisoners what it was his duty to learn, about the place in which they were now staying and its opportunities, and he ascertained of them by his interpreter that all about there were other inhabited islands, where they would be able to make a large capture with very little trouble. And so taking counsel about this, they had determined to go and seek said islands. Now, on the next day, the Portuguese made their boats for the island of Tiger, which was five leagues away, taking provisions for two days, as they did not intend to make a protracted leave from the ships. Zurara tells us that about 30 men embarked in those boats, including Lancerot and the other captains of the caravels. They also took with them two of the Moors, whom they had taken captive, who told them that on the island of Tiger that there was a settlement of about 150 people. Now, but when they came to the island, they found that place empty, 
The villagers were probably hiding, or on other parts of Tiger or other nearby islands, but before they left, the conquistadors did find seven or eight Moorish women, whom they took with them, giving thanks to God for their good fortune. And they rested and enjoyed themselves at night, like men who had toiled hard in the day, says Zerara. And, uh, and wow. You know, I really can't believe I have to do this for a second episode in a row. Quote, they rested and enjoyed themselves like men who had toiled hard in the day, unquote. And that's just really a terrible metaphor. Look, I, I don't know how else to say this, but this is just terrible writing. And it's as if nobody knew what a metaphor was in this world until Shakespeare showed them. Or I guess I should say Cervantes and said, I guess, a more, much more prominent figure in the Spanish literary world, but at any rate. Um, now, I'm suddenly struck uh, with the idea that perhaps some of you who are listening will think maybe it's a little unsavory. Um, that I would make jokes when discussing this. Um, you know, in my defense, let me say that I just believe I... I believe that if we, if we can't find humor in every situation, I don't, I don't know how we could ever find humor in any situation. And uh, that's just a thought to consider, I think, perhaps. Now, back to the story. Uh, Lancerot and the others debated what they should do the next day, and agreed, after taking counsel, that they should go into the boats and attack the same settlement the next morning, their reasoning being that it was, quote, very likely that the Moors, having seen our retreat, will think that we went away like men in despair of being able to catch them, and thinking so, will return to their encampment. This they did, setting off into the night. At first dawn they disembarked and attacked the village, but no one was there, for the Moors, as soon as they saw their enemies retreat on the previous day, came to the village but would not sleep in it, and went and stayed a quarter of a league distant, near a ford by which they passed to Tiger. When the Christians found nothing in the village, they returned to their boats, and, cruci- and coasted along that island to on the other side of Tiger, and ordered, <clears throat> and ordered fifteen men to march along the land and look as if they could see any Moors, or find any trace of them. And on their way they saw the Moors flying as fast as they could, for they had already caught sight of them, and at once all our men leapt on shore and began to run after them. But as yet they could not overtake the Moor men, but only the women and children, not able to run so fast, of whom they caught seventeen or eighteen. Though not all the conquistadors were on land, Zerara continues that John Bernaldas was in one of the boats, which was among the smallest in the fleet, and which was coasting the island, and... They who were in this boat saw twenty canoes passing over to Tiger, in which were Moorish men and women, great and small, in each one four or five, and with this sight they were exceeding glad, at first view of it, but afterwards they were also grieved, since their boat was so small they could only take in a few of the captives. Bernaldez and his men followed the canoes as fast as they could, till they were among the canoes, and moved with pity. Although they were heathens, they sought to kill but few of them. But it is not to be doubted that many, who in their terror forsook their boats, perished in the sea. In total, Bernaldas and his men captured fourteen additional unfortunate people. The, the expedition was not finished, and after returning, gil spoke of their need to continue onward to the island of Tiger itself, which contained a much larger, po- a larger population, and which had already been alerted to the presence of the invaders. In fact, the conquistadors had been specifically warned by the infant before departing not to meddle with the island of Tiger without great caution. Yet gil spoke convincingly, and so the men agreed to his plan, which was to send a small force onto the beach, not wander far from the shore, and simply wait and see what sort of people live there in order to better learn for later profit and in later expeditions, where Henrique would be able to send, if necessary, quote, a large fleet to cope with it and cruise to match, who will be able to fight with all the Moors of the island and conquer it, unquote. All agreed to this plan, and gil Ean set out with thirty men in the boats. Zurara stated that the others remained to clean their ships so that they might be ready for return to Portugal, and you have to wonder a little bit if anyone who perhaps volunteered 
uh, to set out with Gil Eanes, hell, perhaps even Gil himself, was just trying to get out of that duty, which included careening the ships by turning them over onto their sides to scrape barnacles off of them, then turning them back around and repeating the process on the other side, something dependent upon knowledge of the tides, as well as various repairs to uh, needed to be made to rope and sails and carpentry work. And you can see how all of this is adding up and somebody might suddenly say, hey guys, you, why don't you work on that? You know, I'm going to go take the small boat to Tiger, hang out on the beach, and see if I can meet any moors for perhaps capture or trade. Now, at any rate, Gil Eanes and his 30 men arrived at Tiger midday, and 20 men landed, with the other 10 staying in the boats. Afterwards, they took their station on a hillock and began to look carefully over the island. Not long after, they espied two moors coming in their direction who saw them not. These they made for and captured, and in taking them they saw, further off, ten moors coming, with fifteen or twenty asses laden with fish. Some of our men made for them, and although they put themselves on their defense, it pleased our Lord God that this their defense availed little, for they were able to rout the moors, and they fled, some to one side and others to another, and so the Christians captured them all. Unquote. Now, Zorara continues that, while they were there, two men went further on in front and saw many more wars, many more moors, excuse me, tough tongue twister, who made for them as hard as they could. The two men turned and fled and gave this news to the others who were with the prisoners, telling them to fly as fast as they could, for that a great power of moors was coming upon them. So they all made off together towards the boats, taking the captives with them, and the moors came after them as well as they could. And it pleased our Lord God, that the Christians reached the shore before the Moors came with them. But before they had got safely into their boats, the Moors were already among them and fought with them. And only with sore trouble did the Christians gain their boats. All of our men in that retreat showed their good qualities and their brave and ardent hearts. So it would be hard to, or difficult to distinguish who did it best. But Lancerot and a squire of the Infant named Martin Vaz were the last who got into the boats. It's all very heroic, isn't it? Zerara has a way of making murderers and slavers sound like a football team, I think, and in a way it sort of is. This is back in, in a century when jocks kind of ruled the earth, and but their favorite game wasn't football, it was conquest. Lancerot's expedition made one final stop, determining the next day that after this they should stop for Cape Bronco. They arrived two days later and landed with 20 or 25 men to see what the land was like, and when they were a little distance from where they landed, they saw a number of moors fishing. And though they appeared great in number, they had a mind to tempt the matter by themselves, without acquainting those who were in the ships with their project. And they made after them. And moors began to fly, but when they saw the Christians were so few in number, they awaited them, as men who desired to fight in the hope of victory. The Christians reached them, and the battle began, without any one showing his enemy any signs of fear. The armed and armored Christian knights were able to best the fishermen after a little skirmish, when the moors began to get the worst of it, each flying as best he could, and the Christians, following them a long distance, took fourteen of them captive, besides those who had died. And so with this victory, and filled with great joy, they returned to their ships. Afterwards, Lancerot stayed at Cape Bronco, laking for more moors, who now abandoned their settlements in the area, until he finally ran low on supplies. During that time, one additional slave girl was captured, and finally, the six ships returned to Portugal. Upon their return, the, Don, the Infant Don Henrique excuse me, was well pleased, to put it mildly. Lancerot and the other captives had captured, in total, 235 men, women, and children. At dawn, the next day, they were taken out of the caravels and placed in a field that was just outside the city gate. There, the captives were divided into five parts, of which Henrique personally selected one, though before the partition was made, the conquistadors took an offering as, best the, as offering the best of those moors to the church, and another little more to Vincent do Cabo, where he lived ever after as a Catholic Christian. While the captains and the other knights and squires celebrated with Henrique, the sailors had a duty of making the boats ready and then taking out the captives and carrying them on shore. Zurara says that the people, all placed together in the field, quote, were a marvelous sight, for amongst them some were white enough, fair enough to look upon and well-proportioned, others less white, like mulattoes, 
Others, again, were as black as Ethiopians, whom Zarara considered ugly in both features and in body. Now, next episode, we're actually going to discover that not all Portuguese men had that same opinion during the course of the 15th century, uh, uh, and we will see some mi a mixed-race communities develop in Africa as a result uh, of the opportunities for trade and as a result of white people basically running away from living in a terrible system of conquest and enslavement. At any rate, Surara felt no small amount of compassion for the enslaved Africans just arrived, since he asked, quote, what heart could be so hard as not to be pierced with piteous feeling to see that company? For some keep their heads low and their faces bathed in tears, looking one upon another. Others stood groaning very dolorously and their looking to the height of heaven, fixing their eyes upon it, crying out loudly, as if asking help of the Father of Nature. Others struck their faces with the palms of their hands, throwing themselves at full length upon the ground. Others made their lamentations in the manner of a dirge, in the, common, in the custom of their country, and though we could not understand the words of their language, the sound of it, right well accorded with the measure of their sadness. But to increase their sufferings still more, there arrived those who had charge of the division of the captives, and who began to separate one from another in order to make equal partition of the fifths. And then it was needful to part fathers from sons, husbands from wives, brothers from brothers. No respect was shown either to friends or relations, but each fell where his lot took him. And so you who are so busy in making that diversion of the captives, look with pity upon such misery and see how they cling to one another so that you can hardly separate them. Who could finish that partition without very great toil? For as often as they had placed them in one part, the sons, seeing their fathers in another, rose with great energy and rushed over to them. The mothers clasped their other children in their arms and threw themselves flat on the ground with them, receiving blows with little pity for their own flesh, if only they might not be torn from them. And so, with great trouble, they finished the partition. For besides the toil they had with the captives, the field was quite full of people, both from the town and the surrounding villages and districts, for, who for that day gave rest to their hands, both from the, uh, for their sole purpose of beholding this novelty. And with what they saw, while some were weeping and others separating the captives, they caused such a tumult as greatly to confuse those who directed the partition. The infant was there, mounted upon a powerful steed, and accompanied by his retinue, making dis distribution of his favors, as a man who sought to gain but very little treasure, for his chief riches lay in his purpose, for he reflected with great pleasure upon the salvation of those souls that before were lost. Unquote. That's uh, tough for me to read. I apologize. The uh, Portuguese successes in Africa cemented Henrique's reputation as a student of cosmography, cartography, and navigational techniques. In destroying the myth of Cape Bojador, Henrique arguably made all further European exploration and discovery of the Atlantic possible. Now, I say the... Uh, he, I mean, he literally destroyed the magical limits which European culture was constraining itself to. And this makes the Dom Henrique sending fleets of caravels south in search of Prester John and the Rio de Oro, without a, 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 without a doubt, he is a great 
towering figure in history. That leaves me with a few questions. How should we, should we judge Henry? And more broadly, do we judge great figures in history at all? Well, yes, I think, of course, we can judge the great figures of the past. I guess the real issue is not whether we judge Henrique, but how we should judge Henrique. By the morality of his day? By his own? I don't really have an answer for you, dude. It's not a definitive one, other than to quote the great Captain Malcolm Reynolds of the short-lived sci-fi show Firefly. Quote, I figure pretty much anybody who ever had a statue made of their image is some sort of son of a bitch or another. Unquote. Now, incidentally, this might as well be as good a time as any to tell you that just because Henrique is spending all his time colonizing Madeira and the Azores, attempting to conquer the Canary Islands, and sending ships full of slavers to South Africa, he's also spending an awful lot of time Continuing the crusade against the Moroccans, uh, in 1437, Henrique himself commanded a Portuguese army which sailed to Quetta, this time to conquer Tangier, which we briefly mentioned. Uh, 14,000 men uh, participated in that, um, but unfortunately not all of the merchant vessels, or unfortunately for Henrique especially, not all of the merchant vessels necessary for the journey arrived in Lisbon. And so he actually only departed with about half of his force. Um, the conditions did not approve from there. Uh, finally, uh, when they did maneuver into position, then camped in front of Tangier, they actually became disheartened when they realized that the city of Tangier was noticeably larger and stronger, more strongly garrisoned than they had expected it to be. Artillery pieces gazed outwards in defense of the city, and ample forces of bowmen patrolled its, patrolled its walls, which themselves were in better condition than the Portuguese had believed. Further, even after the beginning of the attempted siege, the Portuguese spent an additional six days unloading their own artillery while the Moroccans continued to reinforce the city. Henrique ordered three separate assaults of the city during this time. Each of them were ill-timed, and by September... 4,000 of the original 7,000 would-be conquistadors had been killed or captured, and Henrique and his commanders were forced to sue for peace. Um, that they and the rest of the Portuguese force survived without being ransomed off, in fact, was due solely to the fact that Henrique could bargain the return of Queda, which he did. Capitulating the city back to the Moroccans on October 17, 1437, just two months after he had arrived back on the Moroccan scene. Now, you might think that this would be the sort of mistake that would end a person's career. Well, you're wrong. And let me tell you that it is good to be the king, or in this case, the king's brother. Because while Henrique's ambitions in Morocco had been squashed to that point, in addition to no longer attempting to conquer Tangier, he also no longer ruled Queda and simply refocused most of that energy and his resources into further uh, exploration uh, and of Africa. Now, Henrique continued sending expeditions there for the rest of his life. They were not entirely peaceful in nature, but neither, generally speaking, as we get into sub-Saharan Africa, were they entirely warlike. And I think the best way to describe the intentions of Henrique overall, uh, what he is doing is creating a cartel. Henrique's instructions to the, his Fidalgos that he sent south to Africa included taking captives by force, kidnapping people so that they could be brought back and interrogated in Portugal, and eventually returned, hopefully sometimes, in the role of translator. But the Portuguese also went further south, and there they tried, in farther south in parts of Africa, to ingratiate themselves as much as possible with African rulers. In order to facilitate trade, they would exchange gifts, and you know, we'll be talking about this all in much greater detail uh, next episode, and, and especially also from the perspective of the Africans. Uh, but from the perspective of the Europeans, uh, and s uh, certainly from Henrique, Africa represented a place of unlimited commercial potential, and as a land of, full of potential allies against the war against, Muslim, uh, against Islam. Now, that isn't to say that Henrique and the Portuguese never tried to send a fleet of size to the African Atlantic. In 1445, as a 
Bleh, bleh. Zurara claims that a fleet of no fewer than 26 caravels set out to reach the lands of Guinea. But this didn't go well, and we'll get into this. And Henrique actually never again attempted to invade the African mainland. He did, however, sponsor the number the creation of a number of castellos along the African coastline, and these wooden forts, fortified with lumber from Madeira, would over time transform into larger and larger interpots for the slave trade. The first of these overseas fortified trading factories, or feitorias in Portuguese, was Arguam, off the coast of the Atlantic Sahara and situated to take advantage of the wealth of the Arabic trade caravans that brought small amounts of gold and sometimes much larger quantities of slaves from sub-Saharan Africa in addition to, uh, I should say, rare plants and animals. Now, in exchange, the Portuguese bartered away small amounts of silver, linens, and other fabrics, and most importantly to the Moroccans with which they traded wheat. Now, Catamosto, who is going to be our most reliable source of information about the African trade during the mid-15th century, stated that during the 1450s, towards the end of Henry's life, Arguin was exporting to Portugal uh, 800 to 1,000 slaves annually. And in fact, Henrique issues orders in 1448 that no military action was to be taken at all except in self-defense, where, because since barter was quickly becoming far more profitable than war. As Europeans, Europeans discovered by that time that slaves could be obtained out of Africa as easy as any other luxury commodity. Now, in addition to the profits being reaped by, I, I, again, I'm going to borrow the phrase, legitimate trade in the Sahara, Henrique had another reason to forbid military action in Africa in 1448. By that time, the Portuguese caravels were also making their way far south of the Sahara, where we are leaving off now, and into what is now Senegal, where they were contacting far more populated landscapes than the tiny fishing villages and occasional trading barons of the Saharan Atlantic. And this put the Portuguese into contact with civilizations who are able to field uh, larger numbers of combatants uh, armed with poison darts and arrows, which frankly terrified the Portuguese as much, if not more so, as cannons on the caravels terrified Africans. Now, I don't want to get too deep into this until next episode, but suffice it to say, the sub-Saharan African kingdoms and other polities that existed uh, there that the Portuguese encounter actually will force the conquistadors to deal with them, as opposed to the situation that exists on the Saharan coastline, where the conquistadors were basically able to hop in their little boats, row to shore, and steal, rape, kidnap, and finally escape with their hands full from poor, barely armed and unarmored fishermen. You know, well, sort of that's the basic conquistador plan anyway, so I guess they're doing exactly what they wanted. But at any rate, okay, in 1443... Henrique was granted a monopoly on the African trade. And in 1449, this was extended 200 miles beyond Cape Bojador and specifically gave the Portuguese the right to stop all shipping that wasn't specifically under Henrique's auspices. Which, just to throw this out here, once the Portuguese began to open up new trade, uh, new trade routes in Africa, um, large numbers of, of I mean, Castilians, Genoans, and other Italians, and, 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 and uh, people from other parts of Europe as well, obviously are all on hand to try and take advantage of this newly created Atlantic world that Henrique is, is building. Now, so what I don't like the Dom Henrique, and he definitely gets too much credit, at the res- at really at the expense of all previous generations of his Portuguese conquistadoring ancestors, but he is literally more responsible than any other single person, I think, for the creation of the Atlantic world, more so even than Columbus, who is, I admit, responsible, I guess, for the completion of the Atlantic world as a system, or a start to that, but anyway, Columbus was just looking to expand on that, something that already existed. Um, Columbus, and frankly, he never really even understood the true extent of his discoveries. In contrast, Henrique's vision extended beyond seeing the trade routes. It, it extended to the caravel. And, and, and we've talked about that a little bit, but, you know, I, I think it'd be helpful if we, if we talked about it just a little bit more. Um, and Henrique wasn't on board ocean-going ve- vessels very often himself, and he may have never well have been inside a caravel while at sea, 
Um, he did, though, become intimately familiar with them nevertheless, as the head of the Casa de Cueta and as the owner of numerous corsairing vessels. Henrique's importance, besides him having money, is that he realized that the caravel could be a tool which could enable him to circumvent Moroccan control of the African trade. What really makes the caravel important is the rigging of the ships, like we mentioned, the triang uh, instead of the triangular shales of the square-masted ships, um, the sail of the caravel was not attached to the mast. Instead, it was suspended in the air and attached only by a rope collar. And, and this let the sails respond better to the wind, and, and just a slight breeze would send a caravel speeding along much faster than a square-rigged ship. Um, and this speed also allowed the ship to tack against the wind, which is to say it could travel in a zigzag motion against the wind. So while the ships themselves could carry less cargo, they were much, much faster and more maneuverable than earlier ship designs. The ship also had a shallow draught. It could easily sail upstream rivers. Um, it made it very suitable for the exploration of coastal waterways. And, and, and like... Uh, um, it had some disadvantages because of the shallow draught, though. The ship was easily attacked by even much smaller canoes. And in addition to the advanced, meta the, the advanced care needed for the rigging itself, um, uh, well, th this meant that the caravel required a larger crew and uh, a specialized crew. A caravel's crew, in fact, averaged about 20, a number which would include several bowmen and soldiers, final authority of the ship, um, generally resided with the captain, though sometimes Henrique, as we know, would place authority in the hands of a knight or squire, and conflicts or disagreements between the captain and his sailors and the fidalgo and his soldiers were not uncommon. Um, other important figures on the ship uh, might be uh, the pilot, uh, ideally a local, uh, either in Portugal or Africa, who knew the waters and were able to guide the ship in local waterways, um, and finally, uh, you know, if there was a, an interpreter, an Arabic or an African interpreter on board the, shirt, the, the ship, that obviously, that person would have been kept in, in pretty high regard, especially for a, a slave, um, considering that oftentimes the cargo of the caravels that they were holding was often human beings or sometimes horses in addition to the crew. The ships also frequently needed to refuel for firewood, food, and, and most importantly, water. Now... For Henrique and many of the wealthy families of Portugal, the opening up of trade with Africa represented a great boon. Putting Portugal amongst the great European slavers, such as the Genoans, Catalans, and Valencians, and allowed the Portuguese to profit greatly from the growing sugar industry. Portugal itself began to become transformed by this into a slave-owning society. And at nearly the same time, 1453 to be precise, the city of Constantinople was sacked and taken by the Turks, and as a result, the vast eastern markets for white slaves dried up. Well, or at least the profits for European merchants dealing in human cargo did, anyway. And so, just as the Portuguese began to open up a new major trade route that gave ac European access, Europeans access to more slaves, European slavers uh, were becoming shall we say, hungrier for more human chattel? Now, that may sound like a pretty nasty metaphor, and I guess it is, but it's not entirely unwarranted because many of the African captives sold into bondage actually believed that that was the exact reason they were being purchased and that their ultimate destination would be upon a dinner plate. Now, and we know a lot about Henrique's motives and plans in Africa because of Zarara and, and, and Catamosto, who will get, be getting to much in much greater detail next uh, episode. But we don't know nearly as much about Henrique's other great ambition, the Canary Islands. Henrique's command of the military expedition of 1424 ended in disaster, and as did all his subsequent attempts. And so Henry's chroniclers depict Henrique's efforts in the Canaries as a kind of a minor sideshow. But Peter Russell disagrees, stating that Henrique's chroniclers probably simply had better sense than to spend too much time reminding the Infant about the numerous debacles that occurred there. The 1424 uh, expedition was extremely expensive, and it was only the first disaster of its type. Henrique sponsored numerous invasions, um, 
of the various Canarian islands, none had any success except perhaps some small successes in captive taking, and ultimately he achieved very little uh, besides bringing Portugal and Castile into a state of quasi-war over the islands. Now, certainly, despite Castilian recognition of Bethencourt as lord of the islands, as it happened in 1403, way back on last episode, neither Henrique nor the Portuguese crown seemed at all willing to cede this territory to the other Spaniards. Since Henrique's brother, King Duarte I, convinced the Pope in 1436 to grant the Portuguese the right to conquer any of the Canary Islands not inhabited by Christians. Well, three months later, after listening to Castilian complaints, the Pope nulled that bull that he had just granted to favor the Portuguese. Now, Zarara makes clear that in the 1430s and 1440s, the Portuguese caravels returning from Guinea would stop at the Canary Islands to kidnap the Canarians if they did not have enough captives already. Henrique and the Portuguese even seem to have made allies with at least one Guanche tribe on the island of La Gomera, and for some time, differing tribes of Guanche lived on La Gomera with different European backers, some Castilian, some Portuguese. Henrique and the Portuguese did not end their efforts there, and Felipe Fernandez Armesto goes so far as to argue that the Canary Islands probably represented the greatest colonial prize as far as Henrique was concerned, and that the, Afri and the exploration of Africa and the colonization of Madeira and the Azores were mere sideshows. Now, I, I don't know. That, I think, probably takes things a little too far. And I think it's fair to point out that Fernandez Armesto clearly thinks, if you, if you read what he says to say about Henry, that he gets way too much credit. But he is also definitely correct when he states that Henrique's long-sustained efforts in the Canaries cannot have been inspired by Caprice. Now, since we're not returning our efforts to the Canary Islands for another couple of episodes, I, I think for now we'll leave the Portuguese efforts on the island chain for now and return to that situation in episode 1.5. Um, so with that said, I think that actually just about we'll wrap up this episode, having successfully, or or not so successfully, depending on your opinion of me in this episode, uh, having introduced the Dom Henrique to history, we can now proceed. Our uh, next episode, um, episode 1.4, for those of you keeping score, um will be about uh will we will be talking about uh, Africa and uh, the people of the the Congo and and Senegal and as well as more fully introduce us to uh the later the more chronicles of Zarara and of Catamasto who are our two most important sources when it comes to talking about the Portuguese in sub-Saharan Africa um, now, after that, like I said, we will fit, shift our focus back to the Canary Islands for an episode uh, 1.5 uh, before we finish off the introductory series, Rise of the Conquistadors, with some final thoughts and a look at the newly created African Atlantic. And then conclusion of that episode, 1.6, 1, 1. for those of you who keep me score, we will finally meet that big-headed Genoan who made 1492 so famous. Now... For now, though, um, can we just focus real quick, I guess, back on the Infante, Don Henrique specifically? And, uh, you know, we've been talking, I've been making a lot of uh, references to the Big Lebowski lately for this episode for fun. And, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to do it, Jay. Yeah, great, man. It's, we're in Colorado and all, it's cool. You know, Now, whether or not <clears throat> whether or not we ascribe to the Dom alone credit for Portuguese empire, and thus later really all European empires in the Atlantic, Henrique's shadow falls over more than enough of world history that I think he is deserving of his spot um, in the history of the Atlantic world, if for no other reason than he showed the later European rulers how they might best profit by supporting, uh, by providing support to the European merchants and nobility willing to undertake most of the risk involved in this early colonial adventurism. And uh, he died uh, in November of 1460. He was 67 years old, and 
before that day, at the end of his life, Enrique could look back on a life of achievement, on challenges met, competitors bested, and obstacles overcome. He accomplished more than most men, and without having the advantage of being a king. And so I think he begs us to ask the eternal question. What makes a man? Is it being prepared to do the right thing? No matter the cost? Is it owning a pair of testicles? Enrique was the first great crony capitalist. So at the beginning of this episode, when I called the Infant Don Enrique the first great dude that we have encountered in our story, I guess I, I wasn't really being honest with you. Because the Dom Henrique was definitely not a great dude. I've met many great dudes. Great dudes don't install and oversee programs of kidnapping and slavery, plain and simple. Mobsters do that. And that's why I felt it was so necessary to delve as deeply as we did into the chronicles of uh, Azurara. Because uh, if I just tried to summarize what happened there, and I told you the results of what happened I think it would risk me accidentally turning uh, Henrique into Tony Soprano, you know? I don't want to make him cool. Henry was the godfather, you know, and that's cool, you know, for a movie and all, but, you know, I mean, this, this will not stand, you know? This aggression will not stand, man. I mean, we should recognize that people like Henrique were not great dudes. And finally, to those who disagree with me and say that Henrique is a great dude of history, well, let me just say that you're way out of your element, and you should shut the fuck up. Frankly, the only possible excuse that one could come up with for how you might justify and what Henrique was doing and, and sponsoring in Africa is basically the same excuse that's used by Zarara, which is that the uh, spreading Christianity is such a wonderful thing that it trumps all the suffering that happened as a result of what the conquistadors were doing. Now, personally, I think all organized religions are really a little bit silly, and there's nothing inherently wrong with spreading a religion, but I think it's plainly obvious that Henrique, uh, for Henrique, and most of the other conquistadors uh, involved, that um, they saw... for the. Christianity and conquest was inseparable, that their success in capturing slaves and killing people and getting rich and famous by doing so, this was proof of their piety. And, I mean, even Henrique's job as headmaster as the Order of Christ in Portugal was one he basically just used to enrich himself, using the treasury um, as it was, if it was his own personal piggy bank to finance his conquests. And... So if you're going to say that Henrique is a great dude, I mean, I tell you, he's not. He's just not. And in the words of Walter Sobchak, I'm just, I mean, that dude's a faker. So, I mean, in conclusion, I just want to say that Henry the Navigator is not a great dude. I mean, he's Mr. Lebowski. Well, I guess that's... Uh, the end of this episode. Um, next week, we reset our focus to Sub-Saharan Africa to meet the people there and to consider their perspectives to all of this before delving back into the encounters between them and the Portuguese mariners of the 15th century. I want to thank you for listening. Um, now, at the conclusion of this episode, I also do have a uh, special message um, that I'd like to say. One other thing, I guess. Um, I started a Patreon account, so if you're enjoying these episodes, and they will always be free, but if you're if you're starting them, you can find us uh, the uh, History of the Atlantic World podcast at the uh, p- Patreon.com, and if you wanted to uh, donate a uh, dollar a month or something like that. Um, it would really go a long way to help these episodes come out faster. Um, I wanted to come out with this one about a week before I did. I was actually uh, 
ill, and so I had to take a break from writing. And I, my nose couldn't stop sneezing and all that. Um, but at any rate, uh, I appreciate your support. Uh, anyway, uh, that's it for now. Uh, I look forward to talking with you again. Fuck it, dude. Let's go bowling. Hey, fellow pirates, come and listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command. So let's drop him on an island and leave him in the sand. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. It's a mutiny. Ship. Hey, mighty captain, haven't you heard what's happening here? You're no longer in control, and we're drinking off your beer. This is now a democratic, eagerly tearing pirate ship, so enjoy your trip. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. This is a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. <laughs>